today, I hope to bring transparency to the, to the process of protecting crowds. As more light is shown on the process surrounding crowd control and protest procedures, we can be more aware of, of what to expect in the future and have a better understanding of how an individual in a crowd becomes a threat to public safety. Thank you all for being here today. I want to uh, just acknowledge once again who were joined by, by Council Members Ballone, Williams, Brandon, Cohen, Gibson, Deutsch, and Cabrera. And with that, I will ask our Council to administer the oath and we will begin. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? All righty, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Richards and members of the Council. I am Chief Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol Service Bureau for the New York City Police Department. I am joined here today by Assistant Chief Stephen Hughes, Commanding Officer of Patrol Bureau Mahan South, Oleg Chernowski, the NYPD Director of Legislative Affairs, and Bita Mustofi, Acting Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, I wish to thank the City Council for the opportunity to speak with you today about the NYPD's crowd control and protest procedures as well as the work of the Strategic Response Group. The Patrol Service Bureau is the largest and most visible bureau in the NYPD in the most densely populated city in the country with 8.54 million residents and many commuters and tourists that enter our city every day. Patrol Service Bureau is the first line of defense against crime and disorder. The Bureau manages about 17,000 police officers and oversees the department's 77 precincts, which are divided into eight patrol boroughs. Moreover, patrol services have been responsible for implementing the cornerstone of the NYPD's neighborhood policing, which is a comprehensive crime-fighting strategy built on improved communication and collaboration between local police officers and community residents. As I begin my testimony, allow me to state the obvious. Fundamental to a free society is the right to communicate one's ideas and NYPD believes in the importance of the First Amendment and the public's right to peacefully express themselves. Whether demonstrating, counter-demonstrating, or showing support for a cause, individuals and groups have the right to peacefully gather. Law enforcement, in turn, has a duty to ensure the safety of the general public while protecting the rights of individuals to peacefully assemble. As you know, the department provides a police presence and crowd control at large-scale events and demonstrations. This role is taken seriously, and it is the policy of the department that our protocols at these events conform to the guarantees of the Constitution that, are, that care be exercised to protect constitutional rights and that where enforcement action becomes necessary, that it be supported by a legitimate law enforcement and public safety purpose. On any given day in our city, there can be multiple protests and demonstrations taking place. Recent examples include uh, the approximately 200,000 people who took to the streets in last month's Women's March and, and the almost daily demonstration that have taken place near Trump Tower since 2016, accumulating with nearly 400,000 people who protested the, pres the President's inauguration in 2017. It is critical for the Council and the public to understand the role of NYPD at these events. It is here, after all, with the competing goals of maintaining order and protecting the freedom of speech and assembly intersect. The department must balance a number of conflicting demands when managing events such as protests and demonstrations. These include faci facilitating the ability of individuals and groups to effectively and peacefully express their First Amendment rights, protecting bystanders, safeguarding municipal and private property, ensuring unimpeded city commerce and traffic, containing unruly protesters with the appropriate type of enforcement, and preventing harm to officers and civilians alike. 
No matter whether we are dealing with spontaneous or highly organized events, such events oftentimes require the use of significant resources. Information management is an essential component of effectively deploying police resources to such events. In many cases, the department is provided advance notice. When the department is provided advance notice, it can help plan a route that provides maximum impact to protest with minimal disruption to non-participants. Department personnel, whether it is the local precinct, the patrol borough, or local community affairs officers will confer with the sponsors of the event and make preliminary determinations of what, if any, department resources are required. The department will also issue the appropriate sound and parade permits for these events if necessary. Depending on the size of the event, we can also arrange for closing of streets and sidewalks, suspension of parking, and establishment of points of access for the public. When the actual protest or demonstration takes place, department personnel will help facilitate the movement of demonstrators on city sidewalks or roadways and will at times use barriers to ensure the safety of those protesting. The department makes every effort to work with sponsors, advocates, elected officials, and others involved in organizing a demonstration to ensure the proper level of safety and security is provided. This collaboration with the public is key and is tip, uh, typified by the hundreds of demonstrators that occur each year with little or no enforcement action taken. As I mentioned earlier, at any protest or demonstration, the goal is to strike the appropriate balance of respecting an individual's right to protest and the right of others who have not chosen to engage in the protest. Acts of civil disobedience and violations of the law at times occur at these events, and those that violate the law are subject to summons or arrest. It is important to note that even when enforcement actions become necessary, when possible and consistent with public safety, the department provides multiple warning to those violating the law. Ample time is provided to correct the unlawful condition before enforcement actions takes place. At all times, compliance with a directive from the police to individual protesters or a group at large must occur. I want to stress, however, that if the department has no advance notice of an event, it will still deploy resources and help facilitate the movement of participants. Understanding that the need to demonstrate may materialize quickly, large protests and demonstrations that occur without providing notice to the department prevents the NYPD from effectively diverting traffic away from impacted areas and ensuring the safety of all involved. Blocking streets for the purpose of protests without alerting the police creates a significant public safety hazard with cascading effects beyond the arrest, the area of protest. I believe it is important for me to highlight one facet that demonstrates the department's commitment to the people's rights to peacefully protest. When policing a protest, demonstration, or an event, the department will regularly deploy an attorney from its legal bureau. The attorney will assist in the department's pre-planning of such event and will also be physically present at the event to provide legal guidance in real time to our deployed personnel. The purpose of the attorney's presence is to provide legal guidance to our personnel while also ensuring that the policies and practices employed by our officers at these events are lawful and fairly applied. Few, if any, police departments routinely include an attorney in their protests and demonstration deployments. Many of the advocates that participate in these events will concur that the presence is constructive. Moreover, the department also recognizes the Demonstration Observer Program, which was established in cooperation with the local legal community. This program permits properly identified observers who are usually attorneys access through police lines at the scene of many of these events. Department personnel are directed to extend every courtesy 
and cooperation to demonstration observers. They are permitted to observe any police activity subject only to restrictions necessitated for personal safety. I now want to direct my attention to an important component of our management of protests, demonstrations, and large events. The Strategic Response Group, SRG, was created in 2015 and is designed to respond to a multi multitude of events. It consists of nearly 700 officers operating in five individual SRG units, one in each city's five boroughs. The mission of SRG is threefold, to deploy to precincts and zones as, de as designated by the Chief of Patrol to supplement patrol resources, respond to citywide mobilizations and major crowd control events, and to support our Special Operations Division capabilities at critical and hazardous material incidents. Additionally, SRG conducts daily counterterrorism deployments in conjunction with other department units based upon current intelligence and threat assessments. SRG teams will be deployed to iconic locations in the city to provide a visible presence, promoting a sense of security among residents and visitors in the city. It will also respond to shootings, bank robberies, missing persons, and other significant incidents. SRG's specialized training in crowd control makes it a vital tool, vital tool in not only protests, but for conducting parades, the running of the New York City Marathon, and other high-profile events such as the 2015 Papal Visit, the United Nations General Assembly, as well as the U.S. Open. In order to be assigned to SRG, candidates must have at least three years of patrol experience. SRG continuously trains its personnel in advanced crowd control, advanced hazardous material training, rapid response, and active shooter response. It is essential to note that SRG does not respond to every protest or demonstration that takes place in our city. In many cases, the response will be the responsibility of Patrol Service Bureau or an assigned detail that was created for a specific event. Because crowds at such events can vary dramatically in their size, composition, intentions, and behaviors, crowd control policies and tactics for when enforcement is needed are essential. They are critical to keeping a demonstration under control and orderly. If mishandled, they can endanger officers, participants, and the public at large. In this regard, SRG has been a critical asset to the department. The significant number of protests, demonstrations, and large-scale events that have taken place in our city over the last several years have necessitated the need for, spe for specialty trained officers to work with patrol to execute effective crowd control strategies, facilitate arrest processing where necessary, and ensure the safety of participants and the public. In concluding my testimony, there is perhaps nothing more valuable and sacred to democracy than the right of an individual to organize and express themselves in a peaceful manner. The NYPD recognizes this right and actively protects those who wish to exercise it. What it also recognizes, recognized by the NYPD, is that the right of people to march, demonstrate, protest, rally, or perform other First Amendment activities comes with the responsibility not to abuse or violate the rights of others. The responsibility of law enforcement is to protect the lives and property of all people. Balancing the concern for adequate security against the responsibility to ensure the rights of individuals to peacefully assemble and demonstrate is complex and can certainly prove challenging at times. This is why the Department strives to work with those who are organizing such events. The development of such relationships is a worthwhile investment of the Department's time and efforts because it is not only builds trust, but also establishes ground rules and utilizes the, ex the expertise of all involved to ensure a safe and effective outcome to the event. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleagues and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have for us. Thank you, Chief Harrison, and, and congratulations on your uh, recent promotion as well. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so our first question is, uh, so we're gonna dig into the strategic response unit a little bit more. So how many officers again uh, in the strategic response unit? And if you can just identify who you are when you speak as well. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Richards. Uh, I'm Assistant Chief Stephen Hughes. I'm the Commanding Officer of Patrol Borough Manhattan South. Uh, SRG is currently composed of 680 uniform and civilian members of the service. There's approximately 550 police officers. And I know you spoke of um, Chief Harrison. You mentioned uh, that you have to have at least three years of patrol experience. What other criteria are centered around you being able to join? Sure. In, in January 2015, the department uh, issued a bulletin uh, requesting candidates to uh, join the, uh, the SRG that was formed in May of 2015. Uh, part of the requirements was three years of patrol, uh, a recommendation by the commanding officer, highly competent yearly evaluations, no chronic sickness, and a positive disciplinary record, and they had to be physically fit. Okay, and uh, can you tell me, so just go into the training a little bit. So I know that uh, SRG officers are trained in both counterterrorism tactics and in crowd control, correct? That's correct. And um, why aren't these two separated at all? It's uh, the mission statement with the uh, SRG. It's threefold, as the chief mentioned. Uh, our normal de daily deployment for SRG is in the, they're in the five geographical boroughs of the city. Uh, they'll patrol the one, five areas of the city that are experiencing spikes in crime, generally uh, shootings and robberies. Uh, they respond to citywide mobilizations, and they're also tasked with supporting the emergency service unit at a terrorist incident, uh, as we've seen in the last year and a half with the Chelsea bombing, uh, the 47th, 42nd Street attack in the west side, uh, bike path attack, SRG had responded to those. So that's where uh, the training, I can get into a little bit of the training. Uh, when an officer is assigned to SRG, uh, he receives 40 hours of crowd control training. And that's based on the Department of Homeland Security's Field Force Operation course. Uh, so it's, an, it's a national standard uh, for crowd control, crowd management. Uh, we kind of adapted it uh, more toward New York City, uh, but it is a standard that we use throughout the United States. Uh, they receive the 40 hours of hazardous materials training. Basically, if there's a chemical, biological, or radiological attack in the city, uh, each of the officers is equipped to uh, go in, into a level C suit and support our emergency service at an incident. And the last, they receive 80 hours of firearms and tactical training uh, to, re to assist at an active shooter type incident. And uh, so I'm hearing the training and I'm trying to piece together, um, you know, is it proper for us to have officers who on SRG trained in both counterterrorism and crowd control. Is there a significant difference between the two is what I'm, what I'm trying to, to get at. Um, do you expect protesters and spectators to pose the same threat to public safety as um, terrorists as well as people who are attending parades and, and, or, and or who are protesting? I think we have to go back to 2014 uh, when Commissioner Bratton came back into the police department. Uh, he had a re-engineering re project. Uh, one of the areas that we looked at, what was working in the police department and what needed improvement. Uh, we looked at the, prior to SRG, there were eight borough task forces and they were really tasked with responding to demonstrations or events in their local uh, borough, patrol borough. Uh, when we looked at that in 1997, uh, we had 41,000 police officers in the NYPD, and there was roughly 1,500 officers in those eight borough task forces. In 2014, uh, the department was at 36,000 police officers, and there was less than 450 officers in those task forces. So you sort of drop for the 5,000, 1,000 of the officers came out of the uh, borough task forces. So when we looked at that, we also looked at what was the department facing now. We looked at Paris, there was the multiple attack around the city, Mumbai, India, uh, terrorism was on the rise. 
So at that point, the decision was made due to resources was to form the SRG, give them the three multiple, give them a mission, three mission statements, and that's how we uh, uh, formulated the SRG. Right, but what I'm getting at is so SRG is both addressing counterterrorism and also individuals who protest. So do you think the training is appropriate on both sides? Um, and do you think that officers, part of this unit, would interact with the public more aggressive based on training they're receiving on the counterterrorism counter side? Is, is there, a, you know, so based on the training, I'm just trying to hear a little bit more. Um, do you see similar threats between people who assemble peacefully at a protest to protest and terrorists? We looked at the officer. Generally, the, most of the officers in SRG have three to seven years on a job. They were active police officers in their precincts where we uh, took them from. Uh, generally, their main function, 90 percent of it, is crime fighting. Uh, they deploy into those areas. That's what their main function is. But the department needed a reserve of officers that could respond when there were during large incidents or demonstrations. So uh, for manpower, it's a specialized uh, field to be able to make mass arrests and also to respond to an active shooter. So we were doing this training. We pulled together 700. Uh, the, the goal is to get the 700 officers that we could train in the department that have those three capabilities. And go through uh, the budget for the uh, SRG a little bit more. And where do those funding sources arrive from? Are you tapping into uh, federal money on this as well? Or, or where do the funding sources for SRG? How much a year are we spending? I don't have that information. Uh, um, Council member, I, we, I, I can get back to you on, on the funding source, but ju just the, the, officer, the officers themselves assigned to SRG are part of the NYPD's contingent of officers. Uh, whether or not we use any part of uh, whether it be UASI funds or, or, or burn funds uh, in connection with any equipment, uh, I'll look into that and, and see if, if any of the grant funding is used for, for that purpose. Yeah, but you don't have a ballpark figure on how much you're no, spending no. a year I mean, on this we have the personnel. Uh, we have the personnel numbers in terms of spending on equipment. I, I'd have to look into and get back to you on that. Um, do you see challenges, and in, in just, just getting back to the, the training again, uh, do you see challenges in requiring officers to focus jointly on counterterrorism events and crowd control events? Right. We have uh, the counterterrorism on a daily basis is done by our Critical Response Command, that's the CRC. Uh, SRG, uh, CRC is basically, they do the daily counterterrorism at like historic sites, the bridges, uh, buildings, the Empire State Building Trade Center, and they travel around the city. They're the primary unit counterterrorism is tasked with uh, providing that security. Uh, SRG is tasked with supporting, an his primary job is support the emergency service unit, our SWAT team at a, at a, a specialized event like that, a terrorist incident. And let me ask you, how many arrests have we seen at protests around the city? I mean, if you could run down numbers. Oh, last year. Last year in uh, Manhattan South, uh, there were 109 protests, and uh, we had 322 arrests, uh, total arrests during that time. Generally, last year was uh, at 109, probably only about 10 percent, 10, 15 percent, say 15 incidents re result in an arrest. Generally, the mass arrest, people voluntarily sitting down blocking. It was Trump's election year early in January, February of last year. It was uh, a significant number of uh, civil disobedience arrests. Do you know why? That's a joke. You don't, you don't, <laughs> you don't, have, to, you don't have to answer that uh, one. Council member, just to uh -huh. clarify, the, the numbers, since we don't track patrol based on arrest, based on at the protests or not, the numbers the chief is giving you is arrests by SRG where SRG was the So point. SRG, these so are, this is... Yeah, right. correct. So these but are there the, can be other arrests happening at the same th time? There can be others. They're not tracked as related to protest, related to an event or not. They're done by patrol. But these are, if SRGs deployed, they were deployed, deployed to the 109 incidents. 
there were the arrest the arrest number that the chief gave was the arrest number that was done at the protest and just to highlight that there could be multiple arrests at one event and there could be events where SRG is where there are no arrests and out of that number of arrests there's a significant number of those that are pre-planned events meaning that the participants are actually telling the police department we're going to engage in civil disobedience and we want to be arrested for a particular cause and we will accommodate them for that purpose but those numbers are are put in that's part of the overall number and, and chair just to clarify a little bit uh, last year in manhattan south there were 410 demonstrations uh, srg was requested at 109 of those demonstrations and would go through the criteria again of when does because it seems to be a lot of confusion around here so they respond to some protests and then they don't respond to some what what triggers srg being pulled to a protest so you just said 410 protests last year and out of those 410 109 that srg was requested uh, generally we have two types of protests they're planned and unplanned okay all right a planned protest generally it's uh, developed in a precinct uh, usually the community affairs the nco where the commanding officer has received a call from a group uh, they were looking to demonstrate uh, at a location. Uh, the, the, the commanding officer in the community affairs gets the information. They look at the size of the group, the length, the time, the location, and they'll make a determination if they can handle it on a precinct level. Mm -hmm. And if not, then they'll call the borough level. They'll give my office a call in Manhattan South, and we'll look at the, we'll get in contact with the organizer, uh, see what uh, what needs are there, and then mm -hmm. we'll make the decision. Uh, you know, if it's a you know like the women's march, a couple hundred thousand people. Uh, in the city, uh, SRG would we would request SRG to respond to that. Just uh, the number of people that would be there to help with crowd control. And out of the 410 arrests that SRG uh, had last year, uh, can you speak to if, I, if the, my number was correct? Can you speak to what what do those arrests comprise of? Or is disorderly conduct? Can you give right, me a yeah, variation of? At a, at a demonstration, is two types of action. We have, we call it civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. uh, that's disorderly conduct. Uh, that's blocking vehicle or blocking ves, uh, pedestrian traffic. And then we, another type of civil disobedience is trespass. They'll block an entrance to a building or actually go inside a premise and refuse to leave. So that's what we consider. So, uh, that's those arrests were uh, the 332. I'd say 99% were the civil disobedience. Time. And so no terrorist threats no, no. during any of these particular protests. Right. Generally, when we respond to a uh, SRG responds to a demonstration, they come down in vans. It's generally eight office eight offices to a van, and they'll use the vans. We have prisoner transport vehicles. It's a different type of vehicle that we respond to demonstrations with. And how do you find out? So let's go through unplanned protests for a second. Sure. Uh, can you speak to how do you find out about unplanned protests? Sure. That's generally the uh, SRG receives over the department radio. They operate on a citywide frequency because they're on all five boroughs, and a transmission would become over for a, a level one mobilization. Uh, the police department has four levels of mobilization, level one being the smallest. Uh, that's generally the, uh, a precinct uh, sergeant. Uh, in any of the 77 precincts in transit where housing districts are allowed to call a level one. If they get to a scene, uh, say there's a shooting or a bank robbery, where there's a search for a missing kid, and they need additional resources, they're authorized they can call a level one. Likewise, if there's a demonstration, uh, the sergeant gets there, they'll call a level one over the radio. That triggers a captain from the patrol borough to respond, and it also triggers a SRG captain to respond to that location. So let's go through, and I know you can't necessarily speak to what happened last month, all of the details. Uh, so give me who responded there. So what, that, okay. or can you just go through the scenario? Of yeah, there was, it was a captain uh, from the 6th Precinct that was working from Manhattan South. He responded, and it was the SRG, and we do the local SRG. So SRG 1 covers Manhattan. Uh, so they responded. Generally, a local SRG responding will give you about 20 to 30 offices, additional offices. And what prompted them to attend this particular event? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, maybe I can draw a little bit of a timeline to, to I, I think it'll mm -hmm. flow better and give a better picture mm -hmm. of, of the event. So the, the day started off with a, a two planned events, right? So one of the planned. Again, I'm sorry. Two. The, the day started off with two planned events, 
right, who planned in, in the vicinity mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of uh, 26 Federal Plaza. So mm -hmm. one of the events was a regular event that happened multiple times in, over the course of a, a few prior years. It was a monthly event that happened last year, I think between April and, and December, where individuals, normally between 10 and 12, sometimes upwards of 20, would show up at 26 Federal Plaza. They would walk around the square block, and it was a peaceful event. Uh, that event was scheduled that day based on the historic uh, peaceful nature of the event. Uh, we were aware of it, but did not assign any personnel to that event. Um, so at the event that occurred? Well, no, let me, so let me, I'm trying okay. to, to break it, to break okay. it up. So then there was a second event that day, which was not the routine event. For that event, the organizer had sought a, uh, both a sound permit and we believe a parks department permit from the parks department because the event was happening in uh, Foley Square, which is a city park. Um, so we were made aware of that event based on the requests for permits and the coordination by the uh, by the event organizer. The Foley Square and both uh, Federal Plaza, 26 Federal Plaza. Yeah, it's right behind 26 Federal Plaza. So they're, both events were happening in the vicinity. So an uh, SRG was assigned to both. Or not. Or no, so they, they were, were not. not. So nobody was assigned to the regular demonstration. Uh, it was, I, I believe, it was called the Jericho March, but I could be wrong. But that was a regular demonstration that happened over a dozen times over a span of of years. Uh, nobody was assigned there just because historically it was it, there was no civil disobedience that happened. It was it was coordinated through the fifth precinct, so there were no issues. Uh, the other event. Uh, the organizer had told us that there were going to be 100 people there. 26 Federal? Or uh, the one in Foley Square. Foley Square, okay. Right. We were told there were going to be approximately 100 people present. Um, uh, they requested a sound permit. There were no indication that civil disobedience was going to be going on or that it had any relation to necessarily anything in particular going on in the building. It was just mainly an immigration, uh, immigration event. Uh, based on that, we assigned a community affairs officer and three police officers to the event in the event that... And that's the Foley Square. So that was the Foley Square. Okay, event. so take me to 26 Federal Plaza. Well, that, that's all part of it. So, so that's all Right, part of it. so what okay. happened was uh, the event it was attended by significantly more than the 100 people that we were told uh, of. Um, there were up over 300, we believe, individuals. So the officers at the scene and uh, the captain from, from the 6th Precinct um, requested additional resources. And that's And this was considered an unplanned or planned? No, no, so this, was, planned. this was a So planned. even walking up towards uh, here well, was no, considered I'm, planned I think, or unplanned? Well, let, okay. I just want to, mm -hmm. it was a stationary event. Mm -hmm. It was a planned event. Mm -hmm. um, and although it was planned, we were informed of it, we were not informed the information about how many people were attending, a number that would help us uh, devise the need for resources. Uh, that so you were saying you were giving misinformation. Well, you I'm, I'm not saying it was, or I, I'm not casting blame, I'm not saying okay. it was on purpose, mm -hmm. I'm just sometimes an event, mm -hmm. uh, people are passionate sure. about mm -hmm. it and more people attend mm -hmm. than were expected. But we based our deployment on the initial request, which was 100 individuals. So, so un under those conditions, you wouldn't have called SRG. Is correct. That right? okay. correct. Correct. But SRG eventually did respond eventually, to this? Eventually, SRG was called uh, because... So just take me through that, how that... So, right. so captain SRG gets on the scene, we have a planned protest, and then... We have a we planned protest with okay. significantly mm -hmm. more people attending, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe it was went from a stationary event to a mobile event, mm -hmm. and additional resources were called in to better police the event. And uh, so let's hop in right into, so let's hop into ICE a little bit, and I'm interested in knowing, did they coordinate, did they call at any point um, to request SRG or NYPD? Absolutely not. So absolutely not. Um, let's go into how often does the NYPD uh, work with uh, ICE in particular. Um, so we know that there are 175 different violent or serious felonies that, that they look at. Um, on average, how many times a year do they coordinate 
or within YPD? So yeah, but before, I'm, before I answer the question directly, I, I, I just want to thank you for the question because this is, this is a, a really important topic and we've, we've strived to get the message out as a department, as an administration through the mayor, the police commissioner, with respect to interactions with ICE, what the do's and don'ts are and what we as a city and we as a department do. And the reason it's so important, and, and I actually I just don't want to limit it to what the department does and the mayor does, but I think what you as a city council as a body does and the level of importance that you place on our undocumented immigrants that li live with us in the city, right? Because the, the police department is tasked with the public safety of all, not individuals that are documented versus undocumented. And the reason why we strive so hard to develop the, the level of trust with, with our immigrant communities, irrespective of their status, is that it is important for victims of crime, irrespective of their immigration status, to trust their police and to come forward and inform their police, because the end result would be an undocumented victim of domestic violence, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. rape, of, of, of assault, of property theft, not coming forward to the department because they would be afraid that we would somehow collude with or, or cooperate with ICE in furtherance of their deportation. Nothing can be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. And what we strive for is to ensure that an individual, irrespective of their status, is not re-victimized. We want to solve the crime. We mm -hmm. want to bring justice to the victim. We want to capture their perpetrator. And to do that, we need to establish these strong ties with all communities, including our undocumented community. So in furtherance of that, I just want to tick through a few of the things that we do as a department. Long-standing protocol, we do not ask victims, witnesses, or those seeking assistance from the police department about their immigration status. It's irrelevant to us. We don't ask these individuals what their status is. So if, you have, if you're a victim of a crime or have information about a crime where someone else is victimized, come forward and tell us about it. Report the crime. When the President issued uh, the executive order early in January of 2017, the police commissioner immediately issued a department-wide um, directive that informed every officer in the department of the need to build trust within our communities, irrespective of their status, and the, <clears throat> and the fact that we do not cooperate with ICE in any way or assist in ICE operations. Through our NCOs, through neighborhood policing, through our community affairs officers, through legal bureau and other units, we have gone out to all of these communities. I, for one, know that I have gone out to churches to speak to undocumented uh, immigrants, to tell them about what NYPD policies are, to assuage them of any concerns that we will somehow report their, their status if they come to us. We've worked with the City Council on criminal, on criminal justice reform, meaning the Summons Reform Act, which we do, but with the passage of that law, what we have done is devised a policy that has a civil preference for the most common summonsable offenses. And we've seen summonses go down citywide astronomically. Um, and the use of, city, of civil summonses has, has be begun to be used. The effect of that is individuals undergoing uh, the immigration application process uh, are benefited with a civil, by having a civil summons issued, if a summons is issued, over a criminal summons, which would be more detrimental in their application process. Okay, Alex, I'm going to cut you off. I just so, want I, okay, one other, I, a couple okay. of very important because points I'm I want to I'm still waiting for the yeah, answer I, to the Yeah, I question. absolutely will okay. get there. Uh, we have changed our policies as a department to accept IDNYC, which is a municipal ID designed by the mayor that doesn't look to your immigration status mm -hmm. when you're applying for that ID. We accept that as a valid form of ID that will allow individuals 
uh, to get a summons if they're stopped for a summons, and that prevents them from going through the system and getting arrested. We devise the U we voluntarily participate in the UNT visa program, which allows victims of crimes to come forward, and we certify their cooperation with law enforcement. We not only made rules through a public hearing, mm -hmm. but we create, we're one of the only, if not the only law enforcement agency that devised an appeals process for individuals that feel they, they were improperly denied. And finally, I'll end with this, that based on the local law passed by the council in 2014 that outlines the 170 most serious and violent offenses where the NYPD can cooperate with ICE, we have received 1,526 detainer requests in calendar year 2017 compared to 2016 where we received 80 requests. Out of the 1,500... Go, go back to that again, so... So in 2016, in, under the prior administration, we received 80 requests, and under the local law that you all passed, we cooperated with two because they matched the criteria. In calendar year 2017, we received 1,526 detainer requests, and we have cooperated with zero. And that is an important number to get out because I think that speaks volumes to our intent as a city and as a, as a department to cooperate on immigration enforcement. With that said, uh, can you repeat your question? So I... <laughs> And whoever is writing your talking points did a good job. Um, Ask him to repeat those numbers. Those last so numbers. can you repeat those numbers one time? So, oh, so I have them. So out of, in 2016, you received 80 detainer requests? In, um, in 2016, the way the reporting works, it's um, October and I, so 1st. So when who exactly requests them? Can you go through that? Right. It's ICE, ICE that sends so a request, request okay. for an individual, individual to mm -hmm. be held and turned over. And your local law, I believe it's 14154 of the Ad Code, dictates under what circumstances the NYPD can cooperate with, with ICE on those requests. And, and could you share with us the two that were? Uh, uh, it, it's, so in 2016, there were 80 requests. And when I say 2016, I'm talking about the reporting period, which is October 1st of 2015 through September 30th of 2016. Okay. During that period, there were 80 requests. The two that were recorded as cooperation, uh, the reality is federal warrants, arrest warrants were presented on those two cases. So I'm not sure we counted them as two cooperations because we honored the federal arrest warrant. It was not an administrative immigration warrant. It was an actual federal arrest warrant. Um, the kind envisioned in and the you can't go law. into the particular crime. No, I can't okay. go into particular okay. crimes. So, and then in and then 2017, 2017 15, 26. And we cooperated with zero. And you cooperated with zero. And, and so just getting back to the question, on average, how many times a year does NYPD hear from ICE? So, um, yeah, so. And did um, they hear from ICE on this particular day? So you're saying no? No. The answer is no on the particular day. With respect to uh, how many times a year, I, I can't give you that number because that's not a number that we tracked. With that said, under, lo under Local Law 228, yeah. you called for that number to be tracked. What we basically did was denied the requests. We didn't count them. So where in the past... So we requested them to be counted and you didn't count no, them? No, 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 that, okay. that's not correct. Okay. So in the past, it's been our longstanding policy to not cooperate on immigration enforcement. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. when we would receive these requests, we would deny these requests. We didn't keep a tally of how many we received and how many we denied. So that is something we are very interested something in that knowing. You passed, correct. Something you passed in Local Law 228 la at the end of last year was you asked for these numbers to be tallied and to be reported. And as of January 30th of this year, we uh, just a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, we put out a department-wide procedure that not only requires that these numbers be tracked and tallied, but it also requires that if a request were to come in for assistance from ICE for on immigration enforcement, that a protocol now got instituted where the duty chief, who's the rankest, uh, the highest ranking uniformed officer at the time in the city, uh, he would be or she would be alerted. 
the duty chief would coordinate with the legal bureau with an attorney and make a decision on whether this was purely immigration enforcement or whether there is a public safety need that would require some level of action by the police department or some level or mere presence by the police department. And what prompted that? Your local law. No, no, no. So all of a sudden, there was an incident that happened in January, and then all of a sudden, as we got closer to the hearing, we heard of this. No, I, I don't think that's, that's a not an all of a sudden. So what, so what made us reinvigorate and reintroduce this your, to? Your local, your local law. The effective date of your local law was January 30th of 2018. Right, okay, you had passed okay. the local okay, law right, right, in okay. November of 2017. So it gave 60 days to implement for us to design a procedure. Although we had this procedure in place for years, what we did was instituted a tracking mechanism. So the incidents that it happened didn't make you all a of a sudden. It was, okay. it was a coincidence. Really a coincidence. I just, I'd like to add to that. Um, okay. I'm the acting commissioner at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, B. Mustofi. I'd like to add that since the passage of that law, um, we, our office has been working closely not only with NYPD but with the First Deputy Mayor's Office and our city agencies at, at implementation, right? And so on the same day, on the 30th, that the law went into effect and we were uh, completing the patrol guide updates, we were also completing guidance to all city agencies simultaneously that went out from the first deputy mayor that indicates and outlines what the local law provides and the next steps towards implementation. So you can imagine doing all of that takes a lot of time and something that we began as soon as the passage of that law. Okay. <laughs> Can you go through DHS and any other federal agencies? Are they so outside of, so go through Department of Homeland Security. Is anyone else in touch with you as well? I mean, with respect to immigration enforcement? Yes. Well, not just there, but any, is oh. there any other coordination with any other federal agencies I mean, of, that of we, of course. So I, can you go through those of a Of course. Bit? Those are, those are very public. Yeah coordination uh, that, that we engage in. We're part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force where we coordinate with our state and federal partners to, um, to identify possible terrorist threats to the city. We are the number one terrorist target in the world and it behooves us to be part of as many groups, working groups possible so we can have the most up-to-date and mm -hmm. intelligence to better protect the city, its infrastructure, and its citizens. We're part of task forces dealing with human trafficking. We're part of task forces dealing with bank robberies, with fraud, with uh, the opioid crisis through uh, the DEA. Um, we collaborate. None of those lead back to ICE. None. I mean, the pro we don't dictate who participates okay. on the task forces. They're, they're not run by the NYPD, but I can assure you that we are not part of any immigration enforcement task forces nor is immigration enforcement the primary mission of any of the task forces I mentioned or that we're a part of. So let's go back. Uh, so what is the status of the investigation uh, regarding the incidents that happened uh, in January? Uh, the, I mean, it's, it's being investigated. I mean, there, uh, I, I, it's, it's under investigation. I mean, there are. Uh, and how long do we anticipate this well, there, I can't put a timeline on it. There is obviously people that need to be interviewed, witness interviews, complainant interviews, people at the scene, and, and there are open criminal cases uh, that are going on with respect to the individuals arrested that day. So that's why we can't comment on, on those set of So I want to start getting to my colleagues for questions, but one thing I do want to speak on is perception. And perception doesn't always have to be reality. Um, but based on the reports, not only from Speaker Corey Johnson being uh, there that day, I know Councilmember Menchaca, Councilmember Williams, Councilmember Rodriguez, and there may have been others there, it seems to uh, have appeared that there was some coordination with ICE. Um, so can you speak to what role did the NYPD play on that day? Um, can you go into that a little bit more? Well. I mean, with, there certainly was absolutely no coordination with ICE. Um, but there was ICE, no coordination with well, ICE. Well, ICE did not request us to be present at the scene. They did not alert us to the, 
to the happening of a protest. Um, after the protest was over, uh, we, d we had to learn ourselves uh, the location where the individual was being transported. That was not done through any type of communication. So there was no... So how did you find out where he was being transported to? And, and Because it appears to be that well, NYPD and ICE were transporting collectively. I'm not saying it's true, but it well, certainly it's, it's is actually, deception. It is absolutely false, okay. and, the, and the reality of it is that we reported to the wrong hospital. That just kind of really accentuates the fact that there was no cooperation with ICE. We reported to when, when the individual left the scene uh, in an ambulance, we reported to the nearest hospital. And it turned out that the individual was not there. And it wasn't until we called our partners at EMS to find out where the ambulance went that we learned where to go. Let's go through uh, the behavior of some officers who responded to the scene. Uh, they are under investigation. I know there has been talk of one officer being moved from the unit. Can you speak to why no, uh, this I, individual was no, removed? I, we respectfully can't speak to the incident. There are open, as I said, there are open criminal cases. But there was one officer removed for particular behavior, which I think. Not we're not going to attribute any personnel moves to, to any particular incident. The incident is under investigation because there were allegations made by individuals present against officers. Those allegations are being investigated. There are criminal prosecutions going on with respect to individuals arrested that day, and we don't want to contaminate those criminal. And it was video footage from that day, a lot of different video footage. So I'm assuming you're reviewing that as well. Correct. Right. Um, I'm going to go to Councilmember Williams, but I, I just want to put out there that, you know, it is my hope, especially as a sanctuary city, um, that we are doing everything in our power to make sure that we're not giving off a particular perception that the, our police department, who we wholeheartedly value, uh, is co coordinating in any way uh, with ICE, because it does have ripple effects on communities in particular where uh, people are undocumented. I know you spoke with domestic violence and other things, and we want to ensure that uh, the public uh, is entrusting us to carry out uh, protecting them in a just fac uh, fashion uh, and ensuring that public safety is for everyone. But I think, you know, if the perception is given off as it was that day, I'm not saying I'm speaking for everyone, uh, but it could have ripple effects on our communities, and we just want to ensure as we move forward and these new policies are put in place that we're not giving off that perception. You know, we have to be a sanctuary city, uh, not in words, uh, but in deeds, and it's going to be important that as we move forward, this is a learning experience um, that I think we look forward to, to working with you to ensure never happens again. Um, and, uh, and I will just leave it at that. I will come back with more questions. Can I briefly respond to that, Council Member? And I, I respect the work that your agency is doing, and I don't want you in any way to take offense to it. Um, and I, we obviously respect the work the NYPD does, but there, quite frankly, were some things that were apparent to our eye that just seemed unacceptable. And, um, and I'm hoping it's a learning lesson for all of us as we move forward. So not to cut or interject into what you're saying. I know you spoke of there's a new process uh, that has now taken place. Um, I'll just, before we go to Councilmember Williams, who's the duty chief? So it depends on who's, is it by the day or do we have a name of a person who will be, uh, who will be held accountable uh, on these calls as well? So I'll let you go and then we'll hear from uh, Chief Harrison. Yeah, and I want to just, Councilmember Williams. I want to thank you for the statement that you made and also honestly for the opportunity to provide clarity on the question that's right I raised I agree with you that uh, it's a challenge and frankly it's a challenge that's not created by New York City residents law enforcement or government but by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement right the decision to act in particular on that day was made by ICE and a decision that 
nobody in this city, not the administration, not the council, not the folks before you agree with um, to take into custody Robbie Rugbeer. And so, you know, I think the reality is that we are in a new moment, um, that we are faced with unprecedented actions by ICE in our communities, increased enforcement, et cetera that we each have our roles to play, including the protection of public safety of everyone, ensuring that people have education, doubling down on resources for immigrant, uh, immigrants to have legal uh, advice as the mayor and the council have done tremendously, being honestly national leaders on the front of what we're doing as a city in response to this moment, but recognizing that certainly spontaneous reactions or what will transpire in these moments are gonna be challenging, but that the commitment and the trust that the administration has shown towards immigrant communities and not to cooperate with ICE is constant and clear, right? Where there are questions that we walk through those things together, where there are things that aren't working that could be better, we work on that together, I think should be sort of central to this and appreciate the opportunity that you all present in asking the questions for us to get there. And thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing every day. Uh, chief Harrison, you wanted to respond on the duty chief? Who yeah, just, will, just, just, real, just real quickly, if you don't mind. Uh, the one thing that I, I will say is uh, the NYPD, we're, we're, we're taking pride in being transparent. Uh, with the neighborhood policing and making sure the word is getting out regarding uh, making sure we, we don't do any type of enforcement when it comes to immigration is paramount uh, because uh, our, our, our new philosophy is building relationships is, is, is we, we really value that message. Um, so if there happens to be a, an incident that is uh, not planned, uh, our protocols in place, uh, I'm very happy with, uh, you know, uh, making sure it goes up to the, the head person that's, that's covering the city, which is the duty chief, and making sure he has that resources to speak to uh, somebody in legal, I think is a, value, is a, is a very- um, Give me a name on- who that person would be? Uh, on that day? Uh, yeah, I, if but it depends, mind, I, it varies. It, it varies every single day. Okay, uh, but so are, how many people, how many duty chiefs are there? Uh, there forgive my ignorance. There's I'm, three I'm reading your whole patrol guide. No, no, I'm still okay. in the yeah. midst of finishing up all 548 pages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'll be able to take the sergeant's test. I think it's 38, moment, actually. Yeah. Um, okay. So each tour, there's a midnight tour, uh, a day tour, and a 4 to 12 tour. And uh, each one of those tours, there will be one duty chief that covers all the eight patrol boroughs. And uh, he'll uh, be uh, advised of anything that uh, comes up of, of mass support and that, that needs to uh, maybe a conferral to uh, uh, legal or even uh, notification to me regarding how he, he or she should uh, handle a situation. So that's, that's the, the So they've thing. already been communicated it, to it, as well? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to Councilmember Williams for questions. We've also been joined by Councilmembers Powers, Landum, and Chaka, Rodriguez, and Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, NYPD uh, and Chief Harrison. Congratulations uh, on your. Excuse you. me. <clears throat> um, so, for one, I just want to say, I mean, uh, surprised to everyone, I've been involved in a few arrests uh, in my time here. <clears throat> Um, some of them planned and some of them not, two in particular that were not planned. Uh, one, many people know about um, Labor Day, and um, that was in 2011, I believe, in this one. Uh, just, I will say, uh, the last one happened under an administration that I did not particularly see as allies. Uh, after it happened, I immediately got an apology from then Commissioner Kelly, and I was reached out to by uh, Mayor Bloomberg. This happened, I've yet to hear from the commissioner and I've yet to hear uh, from the uh, mayor about this incident, and which is a surprise to me. Um, I think the, uh, <clears throat> I, think, I believe the mayor just put something out saying that he wants Robbie Ragbear to stay. Uh, I think we all agree in this city uh, how important it is for Robbie to stay. Uh, in that, it shows that what happened, um, what happened that day, particularly by myself, uh, Councilman Rodriguez, uh, not only was it important, it was probably necessary uh, to raise a profile. So in that, I think it would be respectful if someone reached out to us to at least say whatever happened should not have happened uh, or some form of apology. Um, I just want to put that out there. I was hoping the commissioner would be here so I at least could have a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, so I just want to make sure I put that on the record. I'm surprised that this administration that I consider ally on a whole host of issues, we still haven't yet to discuss 
what actually happened on that. Um, I have uh, penned a letter myself, Council Member Rodriguez, and the Black Latino Asian Caucus with very specific questions. Um, do you have any idea when we'll get a response to the questions that we laid out? Oh, <clears throat> we're, we're working on it and we're gonna, we're gonna get back to you shortly. Speak a little bit more into the mic. To the same. Yeah, we received the letter and we will get back to you shortly. <laughs> Thank you. And I do want to say an answer. I believe this city and department actually uh, are leaps and bounds above other cities and police departments when it comes to creating sanctuary city. That doesn't mean there's a f areas that are very real that we have to focus on because they're real and have real, um, uh, real impact. So I, the separate things is what happened in the crowd control. Uh, we have heard from many protesters um, of the forced use of SRG in the past. Uh, and then about uh, the immigration uh, policy as a whole. Uh, so first, uh, just for clarity, because I know we were talking about a law that went into effect on the 30th, but there were new guidelines that were put forth uh, on January 31st. That did seem to be in response to what happened on January 11th. Are you saying that the new guidelines were not in response to January 11th? That's correct. <clears throat> okay, so. The, the new, the law, I, I mean, so let me take a step back. So what, what the law basically required is a, uh, that a reporting, not that a reporting mechanism be created, but that we report on the number of requests we receive from uh, non-local law enforcement in furtherance of immigration enforcement. So in order to, we're a very large department. We have 77 precincts. A request can come in to any particular precinct. So what we needed to do, because now we were counting these requests, whereas before we simply would deny an immigration-based requ request, now we're counting them. So we needed to create a process by which- Just for it, clarity, because it, the Daily News reported it wasn't about reporting, it was about um, co coordination with ICE, you know, basically well, clarifying the now allowed. If, if I can get okay. to that. So the law had a couple of prongs, one of which was reporting, the second, which would, the second piece was about use of resources, right? So I'll, I'm tackling the reporting first. With respect to reporting, we needed to create a centralized process in order to count requests coming in. So if a re request comes into the 5th Precinct or the 75th Precinct, uh, there is a protocol that's followed that the desk officer would notify the operations unit, which is a citywide unit open 24 hours a day. They would relay the agency making the request, they would relay th what the request was and what the purpose of that request was. For, for, for counting purposes. The operations unit would then reach out to the duty chief and the duty chief would then consult with the legal bureau and make a decision on the request. Then that decision is then funneled back through operations which will record both the request and the response to the request and then direction is given to the origin of the request, meaning the precinct that originally. So you're saying there was no policy changes besides that? No, I'm, I'm getting to the second okay. piece. And I'm just going to say, because I, I think the chair is being a little lenient with my time, which I appreciate, but I, got, I don't want to abuse it. So if we can shorten well, some of I mean, I'm trying to be responsive yeah, to your I question. You. So I, I, what I don't want to conflate is the fact that we were compliant with the law mm -hmm. as being reactionary to any particular event. So the law required that we institute some sort of a, it didn't require we institute a policy, but it in effect required that we institute a policy because that was the only way to comply with the law. The second part of the law was a prohibition on the use of city resources, including time spent by employees uh, for the purpose of immigration enforcement or assisting immigration enforcement. We needed to get that out. And what we, and we needed, as, as you know, in a department this size, we operate by procedures. And the best way to do that is to put that into the patrol guide. What we did in addition to that, and in this case, we're a little bit ahead of the due date because it wouldn't have been very efficient to keep updating the same uh, the patrol guide on a, on a similar uh, topic. What we did was uh, with the expectation that the city property bill was, was going to take effect in a couple of months, we also instituted that process as well, indicating that um, non-local law enforcement should not be allowed to access non-public areas of city property without certain criteria being met. So we, we did all of, all of these things in the patrol guide by the due date which was set out in the law. Um, I would say it seems, 
one heck of a quinky dink that this seemed like a beefed up response. I'll have to take your word for it, but from the reports and the commission's response, it didn't seem like it was only that law, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. <clears throat> I have a few questions, but one, I did want to understand um, what the department's position is on civil disobedience versus constitutional rights and freedom of speech, because you, you, you mentioned a few times the importance of the Constitution and freedom of speech, then you mentioned the need to ensure unimpeded city commerce and traffic and contain unruly protesters. And so I wanted to understand that philosophy. How does that factor in to your decisions when it comes to protests? Well, I, I think the simplest way to answer that and to be concise based on your request is to say that an individual's constitutional right to protest does not equate to an individual's right to violate state and local laws. So do you understand civil disobedience usually necessitates violating some state or local law? I, I understand that there are individuals that in furtherance of exercising their freedom of speech, expressing themselves pursuant to the First Amendment, will, would like to engage in civil disobedience. And I, as you've said yourself, you've done so numerous times. Certain times you have coordinated with the police department and we facilitate, we facilitate those types of events. And uh, I just want to, like some, few, some folks are take one part aside. And so I'm firmly believe without civil disobedience, those kind of actions, things don't get done. Just, just asking for them or just having the rally is great and you have to need it, but without a disruption of the status quo, which is what uh, most of us when we celebrate our heroes, whether it's Dr. King, Frederick Douglass, anyone like that, it is disruption of the status quo. I believe in doing that nonviolently, you know, very much, and that's, I, I practice and support King and nonviolence. But it does mean that the status quo has to be disrupted. Sometimes there's traffic, sometimes there's um, sidewalk, and it should be done responsibly. I don't think you need to do it all the time, but I want to know what happens when this is occurring, when the SRG is responsive, if it is a nonviolent um, civil disobedient act. And so I, I want to see if the response is going to be um, on the same par as that. And so on 11th, it seemed that that wasn't the case. And so um, there was also information about um, the SRG will give directions and give people time to comply. Uh, I've been a part of a lot of times when it was been planned. Um, this one wasn't. Um, I don't think that the, what I received uh, was on balance uh, in terms of what was occurring. And so can you just walk me through um, when a decision is made to make an arrest and what is the protocol that should be happening if the decision is decided that this is a, a protest and an act of civil disobedience? <clears throat> Councilman, uh, generally with civil disobedience, when SRG is notified, uh, they respond. Their job when they get to the scene is to report to the incident commander. And that's generally the precinct CO or the borough CO, depending on the size of the event. Uh, they make the decision to arrest or not. And the idea behind that is that that CO knows the conditions in that local precinct, probably knows the groups that are involved, has a history with them. So he would be in the best situation to make that determination to do civil enforcement. SRG shows up at a situation, people are lying in the roadway, they're not going to get out of the car and make those arrests. They're going to report to the incident commander and wait direction at that point. On the same token, if SRG arrives at the location and they see a a criminal action taking place related to violence or public safety, that individual officer can take action. For example, if they observe someone pick a bottle up, throw it into a crowd, reckless endangerment, serious misdemeanor, likewise throw that same bottle, injure somebody, assault, that officer retains that authority to make the arrest immediately at that point. So if there's a civil disobedience occurring, uh, usually there will be, you, you mentioned that there will be instruction given and then the rest will be made. Is that correct? Does that always happen or was that? The no, we look at it, there's uh, the four types of events that we go to. You have planned, unplanned events, and you have compliant and non-compliant crowds. So if you have a planned event with a compliant crowd, uh, generally uh, no arrests are usually made at that. The problem that SRG runs into in the incident commander is an unplanned event, non-compliant crowd. So. At a planned event, normally we have cutoffs in place where people can go from one location, march to another location. Generally happens with the Trump. They went from Union Square Park up to Trump. When they tell us about it, we could put diversions on Fifth Avenue and facilitate that. The problem arises always with the problem with the policing is getting enough officers there on an unplanned event with a non-compliant crowd. Uh, generally, they use social media now. 
It's very easy for crowds to change their direction and for us to catch up. So on the 11th, was it, would you consider that an unplanned non-compliant? That's what I would say at that, at that incident. So when it's an unplanned non-compliant, do you still, in order for it to be non-compliant, someone has to have given an instruction, is that correct? Or do you assume non-compliance? Well, we're looking at uh, civil disobedience. There was criminal action at, at that event also. Sure, so what I'm saying was there, do you have to give an instruction to stop the, the, the civil disobedience, to stop whatever it is, if it's a blocking the vehicle or blocking the road? Normally, prior to our planned event, we have a, a communication device that's been very effective the last few yeah. years. We broadcast what the legal uh, duties of a, uh, a pedestrian is and when they could be subject to arrest. So normally uh, that was in route to that location at the time, but like I said, they, they weren't, by the time level one was brought, uh, our disorder control unit brings a van, attack van, with that equipment to make those announcements. But at the time it hadn't arrived at the scene. Okay, to utilize. thank you. Um, now also, there was DHS and NYPD there, and you said there was no coordination. So I just want to make sure all the answers you gave about ICE also are the same for DHS and other federal law enforcement agencies. And if there was no coordination, um, what was the communication between the two agencies in get, dealing with the crowd on that day? Well, there, I, I can speak about any type of centralized communication. I mean, if, if a federal agent was there and screamed something out to, to officers, I wasn't there and can't speak to it, but that's not what we're talking about when we talk about immigration enforcement or assisting or get, receiving a request. What I can tell you is that we did not receive prior notice of the event from any federal authorities. The notice we got was from the organizers of these events. That's how we knew they were there. Um, we dispatched resources after we realized the crowd size was significantly larger than what we originally thought it was going to be based on the permit applications. We were not told where the, where the ambulance was going to go. That actually... So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> what information is... What, okay, on, on that day and in general, what, what information was given to NYPD and the strategic response group when they got there? Exactly what information was given to them in comportment of their duties at that time on the 11th? What was told to them? You mean uh, PD to PD? Uh, yes. When, when the, whatever was there, when they had to act, when they had to move in, what instructions were given? And who gave those instructions? It was a captain, the duty captain at the time was Captain O'Hare mm -hmm. uh, from the 6th Precinct. Uh, his uh, request to SRG was to escort the bus and get it, uh, get it free to get down to the hospital. At Broadway, it was lights and sirens on the bus. The bus wasn't able to move. Uh, the direction to SRG was help facilitate moving that bus to get to the hospital. You said there were lights and sirens on the bus to ambulance. You, bus means ambulance, Well, right? uh, council member, let, let's not Let's get away from the specifics of that particular. I didn't bring it up. It was just, it just, no, it just I, was I understand. What, what, and what the chief means by bus is ambulance, yes. right? So that's what he's, that's what yes, he's Yes, I'm just saying, but he also said there were lights and sirens on the bus on Broadway. That was what, that will be on the record when we repeat it. Okay. And so oh, my question was, um, was there any, was there any notification that when they came out of 26 Plaza for a good three, four minutes, there were no lights and sirens on the bus? Was that information given to you as well? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so uh, during that time period, there was, there was, it would not be an emergency vehicle. So I just want to make sure all of that information was given to I mean, NYPD. Council member, I, I think the determination that cuts right to the criminal case that's pending of whether it was or wasn't an emergency vehicle, and we're going to leave that determination to the judge overseeing the cases from that day. So we would prefer not to comment on. Sure, I'm right. responding to what was brought up. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm asked a question. If you can answer, you, you can. If you can't, you can't. Um, also, during that information, was there information given that the the bus was responding to a federal agency and transporting someone who might be deported? Was can you repeat that question again? Was any information given to the NYPD or the SRG that in the ambulance was someone who was under the was in detained no. by no. no. It, the only information you were given was there was an ambulance that needed to get to a hospital. Correct. Okay. 
who would need to have that information? Because this is the crux of the problem for me. Like there are human beings responding. So if there is a human being who actually believes that there's an emergency vehicle there, they're going to respond a certain way. Now, we can put that to the side of whether or not that's true or not, but get, uh, given that it, say it is true, then whose responsibility would it be to find out that there is a person who's been detained by ICE and possibly being deported? I think the information is important for the SRG or NYPD to know so then they can realize that the response is, is a different response. And so whose responsibility would it be to get that information? Well, I think it, I think under the new protocols, it would it would go up to the duty chief to make that to make that decision. I mean, in generally speaking, we would turn down these types of requests, right? When they come in, if you're telling, if you're talking about observing inherently illegal behavior or behavior that violates state or local laws, then that is behavior that the police department is tasked to take enforcement. You mentioned that. So under the new protocols now, you're saying there's going to be somebody finding this information out? No, I'm saying that under the new protocol, if there is a request by non-local law enforcement authorities for any agency, in this case the NYPD, to assist in immigration enforcement, then that would need to follow the protocol, which would go up to the duty chief, who will consult with an attorney at legal and come up with a decision. So if this had happened under the new protocols, the NYPD and SRG would not have assisted in getting that bus to a hospital? I, what, see, you're, I think what we're conflating here is unlawful behavior with a request to assist immigration operations, right? What I'm, so what, what I'm not, if, what I'm, I, well, I want to clarify because I don't want to conflate. What I want to make sure I'm not conflating is the moral obligation to prevent an immoral deportation. That's what happened on Broadway. Everybody is clear now that Ravi should stay in the city. Um, the response, and I get it, because civil disobedience is, is sometimes blocking, and I understand that. The response that NYPD gave to me and my colleague, two council members, by the way, and I think I want to make sure I put that out because we didn't receive a response from the NYPD or the mayor, but also uh, another 16 people. The response was as if we were blocking someone, perhaps, from getting medical attention or perhaps doing something that is causing harm to the city. And so I want to clarify why that response happened. And so what I'm saying to you is, and you're saying there was illegal act, so you're saying if that illegal activity was happening, the response was appropriate. And so I don't want that to be no, what the so case. No, that, so okay. that's, I mean, I, that's not what I said. So okay. let, let, so what I said was that we did not coordinate with ICE on their activity that day. We were there based on the size of the crowd based on activities that were unique and happening at the moment. We took enforcement action based on violation, not of the immigration law, mm -hmm. but violations of laws of the state of New York and local laws. Did NYPD or SRG know that it was a civil disobedience that was happening, an act of civil disobedience that was occurring? Uh, Council member, again, I'm not gonna go into specifics. What I can tell you is that the officers at the scene took enforcement action based on probable cause to arrest for violations of the law that they witnessed. All right, I, I got that, and that's part of civil disobedience. The response was overwhelming force. And that's yeah. under investigation. Okay, and that's what, I, and I want to understand to make sure this doesn't happen again, so I'm trying to find out what instructions were given and what instructions are generally given so that this doesn't happen again. And you did help coordinate whether you wanted to or not, right, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. Why was that? coordination made, particularly, as we mentioned, there was no lights and sirens on, and somebody made the call. And so prior to this, okay, even now, let's pretend this happened right now. Who would be responsible to tell the police department and the SRG that there is a detained ICE individual on the bus? So I, I frankly, I, I think I've said this a number of times, so I'm going to say it again. I think it's irresponsible to allege that we coordinated on immigration enforcement for all of the reasons I, I, resp I listed in response to Chair Richard's question. Yeah. In I don't know if you did it purposefully. I mean, let me say, wait, wait, wait. Right, There's a difference, but, wait, no, hold on. There's a difference between saying you intentionally did something or you may have unintentionally did something. What happened on that day was some sort of coordination, period. What happened, I was there. what happened on that day was the enforcement of local law. Can you pull up a picture really quick that was just tweeted out? Um, 
You can say there was no coordination, no coordination of immigration, whatever you want to call it. There was some sort of coordination because right here, where uh, this is Councilman Medanos Rodriguez, Councilman Carlos Menchaca, this is a DHS police officer on Broadway, and this is an NYPD police officer on Broadway. So there was something happening there. Right? You can pretend that it didn't happen, but I believe, and I'm hoping that, that what happened was not intentional. And I want to prevent it from happening again. I, I think the fact that we were physically present, standing next to a federal officer who was outside of, I would assume, his or her place of employment was an unintentional consequence. Yeah, this is by City Hall. There were NYPD officers as soon as the bus was turning before it got onto Broadway, just so we're clear. Like, I, 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 I thought we were going to have disagreement on other parts, but there were clearly NYPD officers and DHS officers working in some kind of Ca council member. You know, I, I think I think what's happening is that you know we're probably having a miscommunication. Okay. Whereas I'm being very clear yes. about what our role was. I did not deny we were present at a at a protest. We were present at a protest. Okay. If federal federal agents were apparently present for whatever reason they were present for mm -hmm. at that protest. And the fact that two entities are present at a protest doesn't mean that the NYPD is coordinating on immigration enforcement. But, but uh, not to jump in here, but you're telling me, so NYPD is on scene and you didn't have one, no one had a conversation with I, ICE on the scene. I answered not that. one person told I answered ICE. that. I cannot okay. speak to if a federal agent standing on the scene had said something to a police, uh, police officer, I can't speak to that. There was not a level of coordination between ICE and the NYPD with respect to that incident. If, if today this happened and NYPD or SRG got information that there was a detained uh, ICE individual in an ambulance, would the response have been the same? I, I don't think that's the relevant piece of the equation. I think the relevant piece of the equation is our laws, local laws, state laws and local laws being violated, laws that we're tasked to preserve and uphold and enforce. And what, we are not, what we're not tasked to enforce are federal immigration laws, and I think that cuts right to... No, it doesn't, what, because... What, what, I because, that, because, can I, if those, can I please no, finish? No, because, because well, you, I think that's important. You asked the question, so yes. I'd like to be able to finish. Mm -hmm. What your law, local law 228, cuts to is that we cannot, as an agency or as city agencies, participate in 287G agreements, which you. are off, which are police officers being deputized as federal agents for the purpose of enco enforcing immigration laws. But if in pursuant, we have never been part of those agreements, if you're in pursuant of enforcing, if you're of in pursuant of enforcing a local law that will help someone get deported, you're trying to get away from that, and I'm not gonna let you get away from that. And that's what I'm trying to stay on. You are enforcing the local laws, and I get it, but if that was helping someone be deported, period. You can acknowledge that or not acknowledge well, that. Now saying, Mayor. hold on, I'm not finished. And now saying that there were people on the scene from different agencies that were not coordinating is even scarier to me. Why would there be different law enforcement agencies on the scene and no one's coordinating with them? And people don't even have the proper information. Do you know how dangerous that is? If somebody thought, if my family was in there and someone, God forbid, needed emergency medical, and you believe that, and you see this hectic stuff going on, someone can actually get hurt. And that's why I'm trying to find out the flow of information. I'm not even necessary, I mean, if individual officers need to be held responsible, fine. But, you know, I don't know what information they were given. I don't want them to be a scapegoat. This could be a systemic thing. And I want to make sure that there's a flow of information down so that it doesn't happen again. But you want to pretend that in pursuant to the local laws that you were trying to arrest on was not helping someone to be deported, and pretend that there, that there weren't two different agencies on them, one of them which was DHS, which was trying to help someone get deported. I, I am not pretending that two different agencies were there. I'm not. I'm merely stating a fact. Okay. I the have to NYPD does not participate in immigration okay. enforcement. And so, I think insinuating that is quite dangerous. So, just a, a couple more questions to see if I can get to the heart of it. So, um, did the NYPD, um, was the NYPD at the hospital when Robbie Ragbear was there? What was the purpose that they serve? 
So the NYPD, as I mentioned, did respond to the hospital. Initially, we responded to the wrong hospital, just to bolster the point that we were not coordinating with ICE on that day. We weren't told which hospital the individual was being taken to. We reported to the closest hospital. Turned out the individual wasn't Five. taken. What was the purpose? For, because of the incident that happened just minutes before, including violations of the law, we needed to be present for the purpose of keeping the peace and to ensure that there was not going to be a, a public safety risk in the same vein that just. The NYP was present at the hospital where Robbie was solely to keep the peace, is what you're saying? That is correct. Did NYPD assist in getting Robbie to New Jersey, traveling to the Holland Tunnel? The NYPD did not assist in transporting the individual. Was the, NYPD present? The NYPD was present at the transport for the same reason we were present at the hospital. We were not present in the hospital room. We were present on scene to ensure that there was not going to be further blockage of traffic further violations of law, and we needed to ensure that in the interest of public safety, based on the acts taken by individuals downtown. Just for clarity, I just want to, well, as I wrap up, NYP was present uh, with DHS on Broadway and on Federal Plaza when they came out. NYPD was president, present sorry, at the hospital where Ravi was taken, even though he didn't admit the attention. NYP was present as they brought Ravi to the Holland Tunnel to get over to New Jersey but NYPD did not assist anyone in, in those areas. NYPD was present at a protest that was we were told about by organizers of that protest as we attend protests on a myriad of, of topics throughout the city all year long. NYPD would not have been present anywhere else but for the actions of individuals at, at the protest site that necessitated NYPD presence moving forward to ensure public safety. All right, I'm going to come back for a second. I hope, I, I'm, I'm finished. I, I hope um, as we go forward, this doesn't happen again. This seems to be some CYA happening here, uh, which is frustrating, because I want to just acknowledge what happened so that we can move on. I hate that we have to focus on this. It was clear what happened. And I think NYP generally does a good job of being sanctuary city, except for some places. Uh, but we really have to figure out what happened here so it doesn't happen again. And the CYA answers uh, don't really uh, help with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Lanceman. We're going to go to Councilmember Rodriguez, followed by Valone, and then Lander. We definitely thank the work of the men and women, the NYPD, for keeping us safe. And I know that Councilmember Williams, myself, we are not yet bringing questions, thinking about, or yes, only having the moment when we were arrested because if that happened to us that we are council members just imagine what's going on with many new yorkers that they are not in the attention of the media i do believe that we need to learn from what happened that day i do believe that it is important to really follow a new protocol and i believe that this particular strategy response group should be reorganized, and I think that there should be a group of men and women that is trained to, to respond to, to terrorist attack, and there should be another group of that unit that respond to civil disobedience and any other action that happen in a city that they are peaceful. I think that it will help us to bring more clarity and for those men and women that being assigned to do the job to keep our city safe in both scenarios, to respond in a terrorist attack for them to do the job because we rely on them. But also the type of training that I see for those men and women that respond to peaceful demonstration should be different. One of my questions is when the men and women of the strategy respond group are dispatched to an area, do they, do, do they get the information of what's going on in that place? Yes, sir, Council, uh, Councilman. Uh, they, are de they are debriefed if, uh, when they arrive at, at the location of the circumstances of what's going on. Uh, they're re-instructed re on the uh, responsibility about civil disobedience and arrest and about taking action if there's criminal action taking place. Okay. And, and, and that's, you know, one of those areas that I hope that we learn because I can tell you that many of the men and women 
they were asking us, oh, what's, what's going, what was going on? They didn't know that they were dispatched in the area because there was someone uh, subject to be deported. They didn't know that there was a peaceful demonstration that yes, traffic was black, and we are not saying that traffic was not black in the area, but for me, one of my concerns is about those police officers asking, what was going on? Why were you protesting? So I think that be sure and, and the mayor recognize that there was confusion that day, and we hope that we learn from this. It should not happen in another peaceful, organized, or no organized demonstration where police officers are dispatched in the area without not knowing the context of why people are in the street. It, how many vehicles were used that day when Ravi was transported from the hospital to Jersey? You're talking about? Cars, vehicles. The federal vehicles? I don't know if it was federal, NYPD, like him. I mean, I'm not, do, do we know? I, I apologize, I'm not sure how many cars were. Cars, uh, yeah. I, I don't have that answer for you, I apologize. But it, it, we have a couple set of cars that responded, a couple cars from uh, our strategic response group were there. Um, I, I don't have the exact number, but I can get back to you with that. Okay, I think it's important, because based on, on Ravi directly, he has said that the way of how he was transported, it was like someone who is a criminal. It was about a number more than 10 or 15 cars, vehicle use. And I think that, again, if you don't have information, great, but I think also we should learn from. And I think that, you know, one of the first officer and as someone that I have been a, involved in many peaceful civil disobedience. And when I made a decision, I know that the police officers are doing their job, as also I exercise my constitutional rights. My problem is the way of how things were mishandled. And, and I know that, again, I don't want to get into the specific, but this is not about, yes, one person being removed from that unit, put him back on patrol. I think they should continue being a deep investigation what was going on. We, those 20 individuals that were arrested, it was not only council members, but they were all also faith leaders. They were also hardworking individuals that they were trying to exercise the constitutional rights. The judge will make a decision who has a right to, you know, who was right or wrong. We leave it to the, to the judge to make a decision. But I think that we need to learn because especially when we are saying that we are a sanctuary city, we need to live by the action. And we need to be sure that uh, everything is in place to avoid what happened, that there any level of confusion there. Uh, have you, how many, I think it's based on the information that I've received, I, I see that there's like a 800 uh, members of the strategy response group, is that the accurate number or there's more than that? It's 680. Is that been the same number, the number has been increased or decreased? The goal of the unit was to be 700, it probably reached 700, but due to transfers and uh, retirements, it's at 680 right now. What is the diversity or leadership of that unit? Uh, presently, it's under the uh, Chief of Special Operations. Uh, that's a unit that also has Chief Harry Whedon. It's uh, the Harbor Aviation the issue mounted. It's part of that group. Uh, there's an inspector, one inspector that's in charge. Uh, they have uh, three deputy inspectors, roughly six captains, and then uh, 30, roughly 34 lieutenants, 100 sergeants, and 550 police officers. Have the NYPD at any moment have a study, any conversation, or any initiative to create any particular unit to collaborate with ICE? Oh, you're asking if yeah. we have created a unit? Have the develop? NYPD in any particular moment, especially after the election of Donald Trump, have had any conversation or putting together any plan or initiating any work or creating any special unit to collaborate with ICE? Well, I, I mean, I, the, the answer is no, because I know what you're, you're, what you're referring to is immigration enforcement collaboration. 
but I want to be clear about something, that we interact with our federal partners, which would include ICE on task forces, but the task force are not immigration task forces. So the Joint Terrorism Task Force are the FBI, the DEA, the state police, New Jersey police. They, there may be an ICE agent on the task force, but the goal of the Joint Terrorism Task Force is to prevent terrorism. It is not immigration enforcement, right? So human trafficking task forces, their aim is to prevent human trafficking. If there is an ICE agent or a, a Homeland Security agent on it, we as the NYPD, we're a participant. We don't run the task force. But the task force's goal is not immigration enforcement. But what I can tell you is we are not part of any task forces whose goal is immigration enforcement, nor do we, we never have been, and nor do we ever intend to be part of those. I would like to want to thank you, the, the chairman of this committee and the speaker for putting this conversation together. I hope that we learn from what happened, and I hope again that since next coming Saturday, you know, that's the day when Rob is supposed to be deported. So it's not a schedule to check in. That Saturday at 10 a.m., he's supposed yes to be deported that day. So I hope also that there is some learning from what happened, and, and again, I can say overall, we've been in many peaceful disobedience. We have some level of coordination with most of them. I hope again that the NYPD also it, it look at any probably mass peaceful uh, protest that day uh, in front of 26 Federal Plaza. If I could just state real quickly, uh, one of the things that we have in place in, in our, in our uh, way of handling uh, any incident is we always evaluate uh, how we handle the situation. And if there's certain things that we could learn and certain things we could do better or you know, whatever the case may be, but we always uh, bring everybody back in that was involved with the incident, be it the Thanksgiving Day Parade, be it the New Year's Eve uh, detail, and we evaluate uh, uh, the process of what we did and see if we could correct our actions to make, make ourselves uh, a better agency. I, look, again, I am holding myself on no bringing springs a day. I just hope, I trust in the process. I know that you guys are doing your job. I know that the chairman of this committee, they will keep putting pressure to find out on what happened in the specific. But again, like, it's, what happened that day is more than confusion. And I hope that we put everything in place to correct so that in the future, we don't repeat what happened that day. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. We're going to go to Councilmember Fallone first, uh, Lander and Brandon, and um, we're going to put five minutes on the clock. Uh, obviously, I wanted to give more time to Council Members Williams and Rodriguez because they were in the thick of the situation. Congratulations to Council Member Richards on your chair of public safety. It's an honor to serve on this committee. I think we're in good hands. Uh, congratulations, Chief Harrison. And let me say, since this is my first uh, hearing on public safety, let me say at this time, thank you for allowing me to return safely to my wife and children every night and to every man and woman and officer of the department, thank you. Uh, I put on a suit, you put on a bulletproof vest. And I think that's, that should be made clear. We appreciate um, that, thank you. I, I think somewhere along the line, this was a, a committee uh, uh, examining crowd control and protest procedures, so I wanted to ask a few questions for myself for understanding. Uh, you stated in the testimony, Chief Harrison, that the department provides multiple warnings for those who are uh, unlawful conditions. Can you go over for us what type of warnings are issued at these type of protests before a decision to arrest is made? I'm, I'm going to uh, allow uh, uh, Chief Hughes to answer that, but just, just real quickly, when there's a, pl a planned event, uh, we have uh, a couple of ancillary units there that can help us um, with uh, direction in regards to making an arrest or not. One of them is we always have legal, a uh, representative from legal there, that could give us some advice regarding. Uh, and this event in question was an unplanned event? This, this here was a planned event that turned into, turned into. a, I guess, a, a bigger event that we needed some assistance. Uh, I also want to say that we also have TARU, our, our technical assistance response unit, that also is at uh, a lot of planned events that may be large in size to make sure that uh, we have the appropriate equipment to, say, film the event as well. But I'll. I'll Pass it over to Steve Hughes to uh, 
talk about is how the warnings are, are, just, are, are given. Right. So I, I guess when it goes from people's right to peacefully protest to the next step. Right. One of the procedures in place. All right. So like I mentioned before about uh, this, this uh, about uh, criminal tres uh, about trespass and disorderly conduct, the civil disobedience. So we worked with legal. Uh, I was just commanding officer the, S uh, the SRG when it was formed uh, the last three years. I just recently got assigned to Manhattan South. Uh, so when we, one of the things what we learned with the demonstration is about communication with the crowd. Uh, generally we were using bullhorns and we were kind of reading off a script and generally with the noise and the traffic midtown, a lot of the information never got out. So uh, we invested in uh, a communication device, uh, uh, they're called LRAD 500, the LRAD 100s, and we could pre-record information in them and they're very clear. It's a nice sound that will go about four city blocks. So if we, and depending on the volume we set it up on, uh, it's a real cl clear communication so everybody hears uh, if we're going to take enforcement action. Uh, like I said, generally on a plan. That's not, often the, that's not always the case, whether it's planned versus unplanned. That's, ger uh, that's generally if we're on the scene, we're going to, uh, if SRG gets to the so scene. So if I decide to take the next step beyond my constitutional right and become a little bit more unruly, what would be the first type of warning? What is the first indication at an officer saying, hey, if you keep that up, you're possibly going to get arrested? We spell out the, uh, generally we have a warnings that spell out the definition of what disorderly conduct is if you're walking in the roadway uh, and not using the sidewalk. Uh, generally, it can be a verbal warning by a police officer, but if it's a large crowd where we're gathering, we generally try to use the pre-recorded -pre warning that legal had provided. And if someone SRG. doesn't respond to that request, what's uh, the next step? Generally, it's, uh, like I said before, it's the incident commander, the person that's at the scene. Uh, he'll make the determination end the warnings and start planning the arrest warnings. At that point, we'll play a warning that these, if you're in the roadway, you're subject, you're being placed under arrest at this point. And if you resist arrest, an additional charge will be placed against you. So there's several warnings in place prior to an arrest? That's correct. Generally on uh, most of the uh, demonstrations we do. And with the 700, almost 700 officers that you have in place, and this year we're expected with more officers than usual to retire, are we looking to replace or boost up the number of SRG officers based on the amount of officers that may be retiring? Not, not at this time. Is there a level, a number of officers that we want to reach to? Is 700 the right number? That's a, the number that the department give. That would be made by all, like our office of management and planning. I think uh, the NCO program is a primary program with the precincts of uh, putting the officers there. So that's a pri uh, priority right now. And are they dispersed evenly throughout the five boroughs or is it as incident needed? The SRG? Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's roughly 120 offices in the four big boroughs, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, and we have 60 offices in Staten Island. So they deploy, they generally work in those boroughs until they're deployed around the city if, it, if need be during a tour. And my last question will be on your testimony as to the difference between 2016 and 2017 detainer requests. 1,700 were issued in 2017 and not one was honored? It was uh, 1,526. So of the level of classifications that we created between minor offenses and those of violent offenders that need coordination, not one of them reached the level for public safety of this city? Correct, correct. Because it's not, just to make a point, it's not only based on the presence of the crime. There are other criteria in the law. For example, there, there are, there's a requirement for a warrant there not all the time well there's there's the hold but ultimately for a release for the I, I know what you're talking about the second subdivision is which is what yeah, we fought for the reason why I voted against this law in the first place because I wanted more protections but ultimately for the release there needs to be a warrant so although there's a 48 hour hold the, the, I think that's what you're referring to there still needs to be a warrant for, for a release. Well, it's my hope that, and there has hands to be aren't tied, that your hands aren't tied in a situation where we do have a violent offender, whether they're, whatever their status may be, that their need to be arrested is made so that our safety can be contained. And, I, and I, I'll tell you, I, I don't think it, it necessarily speaks to that because what we're talking about with the detainer law is our, 
are criteria that are outside of what the individual in custody currently did. So if an individual okay. currently committed a crime, that individual would be arrested, prosecuted, and so on by New York authorities based on the violation of law. Where the detainer law comes into play is our level of cooperation beyond the crime at hand. Thank you. And, Chair, that might be a wonderful topic to explore the differences in it. Thank you very much. I just Thank wanted to so add much. one thing to that answer, which is to say that the reason that you're seeing that spike is not necessarily, um, you know, it, it, or the response, I should say, is not per se that there's a shift in practice from the NYPD perspective. We're seeing a tremendous spike in an overbroad enforcement agenda from Immigration and Customs Enforcement, where they've essentially reprioritized in anybody. Um, is kind of up for grabs, if you will. We've seen a 40% spike of uh, enforcement and arrests of individuals who have no criminal history or activity. So you're seeing that huge number and the non-cooperation because the people that they're seeking are essentially anybody regardless of the nature no, of No, I, I realize the that. numbers are coming from those who sit in the Oval Office. I just, my safety as a New York City resident is not dependent on, on that person's decision. So four years from now it could be someone else. I just want to make sure that we as an NYPD our hands are not tied when we need to make those decisions, and we just don't blanketly say we're not going to honor any of them because it happens to be the person sitting in the office. Yeah, I'm taking the other steps. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Council Member Lander, followed by him will be Brennan. Thank you, and congratulations, Mr. Chair. Uh, congratulations, Chief Harrison. I appreciate you guys being here. And I just want to underline, for starters, my gratitude on behalf of this council and the city for those 1,526 times last year when you respected that the NYPD honored that law and the values of this city. I mean, I think there's every reason to believe from what we know about ISIS detainers that the vast majority of those individuals were, had done nothing serious um, and that honoring those detainers would have been becoming part of ICE's deportation machine. I'll note that they've tweeted uh, aggressively at the NYPD since we've been in this hearing, ICE itself, on this exact issue. Like, that's what they want. They want to make this city afraid of its immigrants. They want immigrants afraid of the police. And I'm proud that we're not doing that. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to uh, push down a little, though, on some of these questions about um, what happened on that day and what it means going forward. And I'm just going to focus on the NYPD escort from Bellevue to the Holland Tunnel. Um, and you know, I was there that day, actually, upstairs with Ravi's wife and his lawyer, which was why I was not downstairs in the street. And we also thought they were going to Lower Presbyterian. I think that's what actually ICE had told Ravi's lawyer. And, and his wife was where the, the they were going. So that's why you thought that's where they were going. They, de you know, they went to Bellevue instead. Up to that point, you guys were responding to a protest. But at Bellevue, there was no protest. There were no protesters. No one even knew he was there till after he was there. And from Bellevue to the Holland Tunnel, I don't see one iota of reason to believe that there was a public safety risk. And I don't really believe it was derivative of the protest that took place that morning. So I don't think that should have happened. And I'm not, I mean, I appreciate that you have new people in place, but if that was an appropriate action, then I don't know what wouldn't be. So give me a little, help me understand better why it was appropriate under our current guidelines for there to be an NYPD escort from Bellevue to the tunnel. I mean, council member, I think. Or tell me it was inappropriate, which is what I think, and then I'll be much more comfortable that our policies are right going forward. Well, no, what, what, I'm, what I will say is that the department was faced with a somewhat unique set of circumstances that day uh, at the protest site. But we, at Bellevue, what was unique at I, Bellevue? If I can, if, I think everything ties in, and as you said, there are derivative actions, so I would like to start at that point to better explain and to better answer your question. So we were at the scene of a protest where we believed there were going to be 100 demonstrators. That crowd very quickly swelled, and we found ourselves under-resourced. We had to call in resources on an expedited basis. What happened was there were arrests that were made, obviously, without getting into specifics and all of the events that transpired from that. What we felt at that moment, based on the public safety threat that was created downtown, we felt the need to be present at the hospital in the event that the protest would continue to that location, or if the 
protests were to con continue on to any you part see of any the city. any evidence at all that protesters were going from 26 Federal Plaza or Broadway up to Bellevue? Well, a car, I, a person, you got a lot of eyes and ears on the ground and you had it in both places. Was there any evidence, there was no evidence that protesters well, were going Council to Bellevue. Member, None I, went I mean, to Bellevue. Uh, Council member, hindsight is great and to- this is, But this is my concern, no, no, this well, isn't about, let me, let me be clear about why I'm asking. Right. Because I feel like th there, was, there was no reason, there were no protesters at Bellevue. We knew at that point that he wasn't actually in any health risk. There was no protest, there were no protesters. There were no individuals trying to put themselves in the line of the deportation machine, and there was no health risk. ICE asked for an escort, and the NYPD provided an escort. We shouldn't do it. And honestly, if the protocol is that discontinuous, that the general idea that because some people protested miles away, they might come protest miles away, and therefore we're going to provide an escort, then I'll be honest, you're gonna have to provide an escort for every single ICE deportation. Because I'll be, this is where like, I'm concerned our protocols are not up to date with where things are on the ground. Uh, you, I've participated in also, maybe not as many as Councilmember Williams, but quite a few civil disobedience arrests, all planned, all worked out with you guys in advance. And that's great when it can happen. But I'll, I'll be clear, if ICE continues to deport people like Ravi, I'm gonna put myself in the way. And that might look different. I won't be able to call you in advance, organize it in advance. I understand that it'll be treated differently because of that. But I guess I'm telling you right now I might be in the way. And if that fact means that you're gonna be afraid every time that ICE is deporting someone that you have to send an escort, then you're gonna be escorting every single deported person. There was no connection between the protest and Bellevue. We should not have provided an escort. What happened on the ground, on the scene, was, was complex, and I'm not gonna go back into that. But what I know for sure is, we should not have provided an escort from Bellevue to the Holland. And if our policy continues to be that even though a different person now will need to give that authorization, essentially we would do it again, I guess let me maybe ask that. Given what you know, was that the right call? And if asked again, would the NYPD, under its new protocols, provide the escort from Bellevue to the Holland? Well, the, the NYPD, I'm, I'm not gonna do a hypothetical, but what I'll tell you is that the NYPD is gonna evaluate every situation on a case, if I, if I can finish, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and make a decision in the interest of public safety. I mean, to your point, that you, you know, you're talking about under a, a certain standard, uh, which I, I don't think there is a standard. There's an evaluation of a case by case based on case specific facts, but that we're going to somehow be roped into providing some sort of escort. I'm not aware of any, if I can finish, I'm not aware of any escorts that have been provided. We were faced with a unique set of circumstances on that day, and we took actions was that we- the unique set of circumstances? We there had been a protest in one and we place, took actions, and therefore you believed it and we would be in the other place? we took actions that we believed were appropriate in furtherance of public safety. You believe it was appropriate yes. to provide that escort from Bellevue to the Holland? We didn't provide an escort. We were present during a transport, and we were present at a hospital to ensure- What is we the difference gonna, between being we present were, during uh, your cars were present during the trip, but you don't call that an escort. We did not have, What's the distinction? We did not have custody of anyone. Land he, land. The individual was not in any of our vehicles. You, we were present based on the public safety concern, Come on. based on say, incidents that, that happened car, downtown. The NYPD car, that, or cars, we didn't know how many, that drove along with the ambulance from Bellevue to the Holland was not an escort. It was present, but it was not an escort. Really? We were present at the scene. And you were not escort. You were not escorting ICE. ICE had not asked. I I view we at no. How time, did you know ICE no, was at, at Bellevue? At, through we found out through EMS when we arrived at the wrong hospital initially. Who told them? I would assume they know where their ambulances are going. Okay. So. I am more concerned walking out of this hearing than I was walking into it, because here's what I think you told me. 
Well, I'm I just, think uh, you told I me. No, I'm going to finish. I think I'm it's done with my time. That you're concerned because as as you, you made me much more concerned because you told me as essentially you that it was appropriate. You started off by commending the department. And the department, 1,526 for, times last year, correct. honored our and law there, and our There's values. no indication that we've participated in any type of immigration enforcement. And based on a based on the scenario that we were placed in, not that we chose to be in, we were placed in that we needed to police in furtherance of public safety. The we are now okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on instead but of a we're gonna go back and required forth required you to provide an escort from miles away with no public safety risk and no public health risk. And if you would just say we screwed up. We should not have provided an escort from downtown was a mess, okay? And I'm open to hearing the investigation. You should not have provided an escort from Bellevue to Holland. I think you know it. There was no reason, there was no public safety, there was no connection from what happened at Federal Plaza. You just shouldn't have done it. I think our policy is we shouldn't do it and we won't do it going forward. But by refusing to say that, by telling me it was justified, you're making me concerned it is now our policy and that very tenuous connections to the possibility of any disruption or protest would justify NYPD escort and support. And that is very troubling because I fear we're gonna see more of it. Because if those dreamers start being deported, lots of us are gonna put ourselves in the way. And if the basic fact of the possibility that we will means we're going to escort the ICE deportation machine. Anyway, I, I wish I weren't, I, I'd hoped to get less. I really do mean the praise that I said. I really am proud of the policies. I really do hope we're getting them right. But I got to be honest, what you told me today makes me less sure um, and less confident that we've got the right policies in place. I, I'm sorry that's true, but, but it is. Thank you, Councilmember Landa. We're going to go to Brannon, followed by him, will be Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. Um, I echo my, some of my colleagues have said that uh, men and women of the, of the New York City Police Department uh, do an extraordinary job facing down the unknown every day. It takes an extraordinary amount of courage, and I don't think that should be taken lightly, and that's certainly not uh, what's, what's um, for debate today. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was I know that Initially, uh, the incident, um, I believe there was only one squad that was uh, dispatched. Do you think that, and then once, once it was called, you know, in all hands, that's when things got, you know, maybe a little bit more aggressive than, than it would have been. Is that because we were just caught, you know, uh, not prepared, or uh, is it a staffing issue? If we had more cops on the street, maybe they would have been dispatched, you know, at, from the get-go? Uh, we, once, once we, we initially were, were told that the protesters, uh, the peaceful demonstrators, I should say, um, was going to be at a certain, a certain number. So there was no need for a strategic response group to be there or, or uh, anything else. So initially, the planned event, um, we had a minimal amount of officers there. Uh, once it got to the point where we were somewhat, uh, we lost a little bit of control of the event, that's where we uh, went to the point of uh, requesting a mobilization. And that's where you saw the response from, uh, from strategic response group uh, to, the, uh, to the incident. Do you, I mean, I guess it's, I don't want to get into a hypothetical, but do you think that the response might have contributed to the escalation of the incident? Because initially it was understaffed? Uh, I, I don't want to. I, I think that's uh, incorrect due to the fact that the uh, strategic response group, this is what they're trained to do. They're trained to make sure that they, uh, any event uh, that goes on where there's the demonstration may get into a little bit of uh, civil disobedience. They know how, they're, the, they're the, the experts in regarding making sure that the event still could run smoothly without uh, any other uh, distractions to the, to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brandon. Uh, we're going to go to Councilman Manchaka. Thank you, Chair. And, and again, congratulations on, on your, uh, this is your first hearing. Yes, it is. Um, so congratulations. Didn't expect for it to start this way. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, gonna, we're going right into it. We're going right into it. Um, and I get, to, I get to continue to chair the, the, the Committee on Immigration, and I'm really excited to do that. Um, I know a lot of what you presented as a team 
um, from Moya to NYPD has been productive. That's because our partnership in the last term was productive. Uh, the, the, the local law 228 that we've been talking about really kind of sets the tone and the vision for what we're doing. I really do hope that, uh, and I know we're in the middle of revisions on some of these policies, that we can clear up some of the things that came out, came out of this hearing and make sure that we can get it right. Uh, and that's an important piece that I want to just say right now as a member of this committee um, that we work to make sure that we clarify all those pieces. One of the things that I want to keep, keep an eye on beyond everything that we're moving forward on is really trying to understand a moment in time where in advance of an ICE activity, will NYPD be um, uh, available to clear an area, uh, again, in advance of an ICE activity? No. No, okay. I mean, that, I mean, that cuts directly to uh, Local Law 228, right? So, and, I, and the reason I ask this is, is the definition of public safety is, is what is really what's kind of connecting all these conversations and these discussions. What, what does it mean for public safety? And, and I understand that the 287G agreements have not, we haven't had that in the recent history. I, in fact, in fact, I kind of want to ask, when's the last time we had a 287G? I don't think we've ever had a 287G. Never had one, and you mentioned that earlier. Um, but it gets gray when there's an official deputization of an officer of the NYPD to administer an immigration process that we're saying no to, but when public safety is in, in consideration, we need to be clear in definition about what, the, what that means. Uh, and I know that a lot of this stuff is done with a lot of discretion, and we want to give you that discretion, but the, the power that we have at the council and oversight is to really try to understand exactly what that means. And when ICE is, is as Brad kind of pointing to, this is going to get worse before it gets better. The administration is, is really clamping down. We're seeing more and more ICE activity across the country. It's even happening here. Um, uh, when, we're, when we're hearing about 7-Elevens and other ICE raids that are happening in the city, we want to make sure that we understand this in, in this moment right now where we're not in the middle of, uh, of a raid or a deportation that the city, um, both council and residents, are going are gonna to step in and stand up and fight back and do civil disobedience. And so I think that's, that's the one thing I wanna, I wanna highlight is our understanding of public safety. And so if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna answer that now, um, but this is gonna be an ongoing conversation for us as we see it. Okay. Um, I wanna, look, everything was asked. We saw, we saw what we saw, uh, the investigation is, is ongoing. One question about the investigation, is it going to ask uh, is the investigation of January 11th going to ask whether or not there was any conversation, not coordination, because you're saying no to coordination, but conversation between the officers that were on the scene? Is that something that will be revealed through your investigation? I mean, it's whether you're asking if if there was a conversation between... Conversations between NYPD, not collaboration. You're saying no to collaboration right now, and I, and I get that. The ICE and DHS didn't request you all. You showed up, and you did what you did. But will the investigation reveal whether or not there were conversations between officers of any level and DHS during the Broadway incident? I mean, will... I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not an investigator, so I'm not sure what, what it'll reveal, but it okay. can possibly reveal that. So can we request that the investigation reveal that determination, whether or not there were conversations on Broadway between NYPD officers and DHS officers? Okay, I'll make, I'll make a note of it. Okay, and, and that's important because I think this is gonna help us understand where, where we define laws and where where just human nature comes into play, and and we're going to be playing in this human nature gray area more, more and more. Uh, our policies, we do not want them to fail, uh, and in some ways, we're pointing to you where they are potentially failing, 
And that's, that's an important piece. We were all there. We saw it. We saw communication happening. And so I want to make sure this investigation, an official investigation for the NYPD reveals that. Uh, okay, I think, I think I'm done. I'm really proud of this committee and the members that asked you questions. I applaud the work um, that you are doing, that the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is doing, and that we're going to do together in the future to clarify the guidance that we're all talking about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. We're going to go to Councilmember Williams. One o'clock this time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> oh, look, um, I know in the, in the paper there's at least one deputy mayor that thinks we're not that bright. Um, but I think we are actually a, a pretty uh, bright group. And so, you know, what in the, one of the frustrations, I, I didn't expect it to be this contentious. I thought we were all going to agree that there were some mistakes that happened and then we were going to be able to move on from that. My frustration is that there doesn't even seem to be an acknowledgement that there were mistakes that happened. Like, at least, I mean, if you don't want to call it coordination, assistance, whatever, going to the Holland Tunnel should not have happened. Right? That, that is one clear thing that should not have happened. There was definitely confusion on the ground on Broadway that should not have happened. Why? And so for me, it's, and so they want us to believe that there was no coordination, no assistance. You also want us to believe that the new guidelines that came out had nothing to do with that uh, incident. I, I just, I don't know if I believe all that. That is frustrating because uh, I, I always applaud so, some of the great work that the police department is doing, definitely. And you only got to mess up once. That's a very hard job to have. Well, you mess up once and everything else is forgotten. And I don't want to do that. I want to say, okay, here is a mistake. Let's fix it. It's hard to say that when there's no acknowledgement <laughs> that something bad happened, even as you're changing the guidelines. So you're changing the guidelines to do something better while not even acknowledging that something bad happened. That is a frustrating place to be in. I just want to make sure I put that in because I think we all want to make sure that what occurred doesn't occur again um, in terms of immigration and also other protests. And so just a few questions. One, I just wanted to just make sure with the hospital, were you inside of the hospital or were you outside of the hospital on January 11th? We, um, I believe we were in the in the ER section, but not in the place where the <coughs> patients are. Okay. So we were on the outside and in the, I obviously, the waiting area, but yeah. we're not in, not it inside where patients are being. It just further to say that, you know, I don't think there was a need for PD to be there. Um, um, also, just to be clear, if you, the question he asked was where, if you're enforcing certain local laws, which is a decision you have to make, like if someone's blocking traffic, but you have to know that could be in furtherance of helping someone be departed. And PD just has to make a decision when and where they're going to do that. And I say that because if uh, I felt bad for some of the officers in speaking to them, they had no idea why they were there, right? They were asking us what was occurring. If my family was in an ambulance and God forbid something was happening and people were blocking it, I'd want every two U's to move them out of the way, right? But if it's a civil disobedience to someone who was being detained about to be deported, that should be a different response. Why the response didn't happen is what I was hoping to get into the uh, the weeds were today, but we were unable to do that. And so I still have questions about who gives them the directions when they go. So when they go to a protest, is someone saying this is a civil disobedience protest? Is someone saying this is a non-compliant protest? Who is giving SRG instructions? And what instructions are they getting when they get there so they respond accordingly? So they respond to a civil disobedience as a civil disobedience, and they respond to something else as something else. Like who, who gives that? How does that work from start to finish, and particularly when it's an unplanned uh, protest. Uh, hey, council member, it's uh, the highest ranking patrol officer on the scene, so in that case there was a captain at the scene would give direction. Uh, or it could be a sergeant or a lieutenant. It's generally some patrol, the precinct, uh, patrol officer personnel. SRG is supporting unit. Uh, they respond to the highest ranking uh, patrol officer to, at that incident and make that decision. I know. I'm, uh, so, on that day, the, the information, I'm trying to figure out, the information was not known to the highest ranking officer, or the highest officer, ranking officer did not relay that information to the SRG? The information known of, about what in particular, I just want to make yeah, sure no, I understand. Yeah, no information about why people were on the street that particular time. I mean, we... We sometimes learn, I mean, we're, we're really, we don't do content-based policing at First Amendment events, so people can protest for or against anything, and there, there's a, a whole laundry list of 
protests, you know, where people take various sides and, and we appear there. So we don't base our enforcement action or policing based on the content of an individual's message. So, I mean, sometimes the signs are pretty obvious. They're out in the open. You, you, you kind of uh, infer what the process is about. Sometimes the organizers will come and, and they'll seek a sound permit or a parks permit or whatever and they talk about what their event is about. You know, sometimes it's an unplanned event and you just, you look around, you listen to the chants, you, you, you kind of see the signs and you infer what the protest is about. But regardless of what the protest is about, it doesn't guide what our enforcement is gonna be. Okay. The ac actions guide enforcement, it's not words. It's not the message that protesters are trying to get out. Okay. I want to say thank you and congratulations on your, on your first hearing. My hope is that this conversation will continue with, I, mean, I want to do it with less tension because I, I sincerely hope, uh, I know Robbie has another appointment on Saturday. I hope the whole city comes out and I hope if they detain him and I hope every EMOR det detention has as much disruption to the status quo as humanly possible because it is immoral. And so we have to figure out because you have a job to do and we believe we have a job to do, how that's going to work. And the only way that that can happen is if we're honest about mistakes that are made. Because I, I am going to bet that on either side, mistakes are going to happen going forward. And we shouldn't be afraid to say, look, this shouldn't have happened. This is what we're doing to correct it. And that, that, that's, I just want to point out that my frustration came from that. It seemed like there's just no acknowledgement that something wrong happened. So it's hard to correct that. But thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Councilman, uh, if, if you don't mind, I, I appreciate maybe working with you down the road to make sure that these events that go on Run, run cohesively uh, to make sure that everybody is uh, uh, taken care of in the city. Thank as you. Well as, as well as the protesters. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Williams. Uh, last question. Uh, I know Councilmember Powers had to step out. Uh, so on the Trump uh, security, President Trump, 45, uh, city is receiving uh, the exact reimbursement that we've requested. So on the Trump security at the towers, at his tower, when he comes uh, in. I'll I don't have the exact number. I mean, that, that, I, I didn't come prepared with that given the topic of the hearing. Okay. But you're talking, just to be clear so I know the number to get you. prepared for a Trump question. <laughs> you, okay. uh, you're talking about reimburse, uh, reimbursement yeah, for, for security the, at, the t at his towers. Uh, ongoing or during the pre no, 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 not, not anything, just sidebar conversation. You guys are providing security when he comes yep. in town or when he's not yep. in town. I believe it's part of the Edward Byrne grant, I think, possibly. Right. Um, so just wanted to know if you're receiving that reimbursement uh, for providing uh, safety to the towers and how much as well. If you could get that back to us it doesn't have to, to today. All right. I want to thank you. And I, I, I first off want to thank uh, the NYPD, the SRG unit in particular and everyone else because we've had a lot of activity activity in New York City and, you know, for the most part, um, you know, there haven't been any much complaints. Um, I think you've handled yourselves uh, mostly appropriately. Uh, I know we had the Women's March uh, and other things, and we want to thank you for uh, the work of ensuring that we could uh, have freedom and, and, and speak about things and, and, uh, that are going on uh, around the country and protest and, and peace. Um, and do some civil de disobedience here and there as well. Um, but I want to thank the NYPD for, the, for handling it, uh, majority incidents, uh, the right way. Um, but also say we still have a long way to go. Uh, we know that we're going to see more, <laughs> much more increased activity under this administration. And it's my hope that we'll be uh, prepared uh, for it, uh, even as unplanned things happen. We know that social media, just as you spoke of, and other outlets, uh, we'll certainly make sure that that's more hyper. Um, um, one thing, uh, just leaving here, just a few requests. So um, I know you're putting new guidelines in place. Uh, we would love if you got a full report to the committee and to the council on what all of those particular things look like. Uh, I know that we did do some announcements earlier this week, uh, but certainly would love to see all of the particulars of what's being put in place so that as we move forward, uh, you know, we don't have to repeat these sort of incidents. Also, uh, I would really love uh, if you looked at, uh, and this, this goes to SRG, I know you have upwards of 700 officers. Uh, one of the things I would love to see is, is, is sort of a separation between those who would deal with counterterrorism, 
opposed to those who would deal with protests and parades. So maybe separating out those two things is something you should give thought to. Um, I look, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more from you. I'm not here to pretend that I know all of the intricacies of why this may be important to have both together, but I think there should be some room to separate the two. Um, you know, for instance, I wouldn't put a Marine to guard a children's park because of spilled milk. I'm not equating spilled milk to protest or anything, but I think we should certainly look at the two separately. I um, also just want to point out to the public that although we've had two members, and obviously the speaker and others who were on the scene, this hearing was not necessarily just based on, called based on their experience. We want to make sure that we're protecting the entire public and those who don't have the stature to be in this room uh, at this time to question you uh, on protests. So I just want to put that out there that was speaking for you as well, although this incident did occur. Um, with that being said, uh, I want to thank you for coming out. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to thank MOVA for the work that they're doing uh, day in and day out to protect the public and to protect the city. And we look forward to a continued uh, dialogue, constructive dialogue on how we can work together uh, to make sure that this is a just city for all. So thank you all for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to call the first panel. Zachary Ahmad, uh, New York Civil Liberties Union, Tawaki Kamatsu, Lenny Dario, uh, Nahal Zamani, or Johayan Kong. Did I say it right? She'll tell me if I said it wrong. Community United for Police Reform, Lenny Dario, Tawaki Kam Kamatsu, yeah. Zachary Ahmad, NYCLU. You're testifying? Okay, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. You're always welcome in the people's house. All right, we're going to give you each five minutes, so I'll let you begin, sir. And if you can identify yourself and who you're representing uh, before you begin, we would most appreciate it. Thank you, uh, My name is Zachary Ahmed, and I'm from the New York Civil Liberties Union, the NYCLU. Um, thank you, Chairman, for uh, ha inviting, for ha making this opportunity for us to speak to you today. Um, I, I will try and be brief. Uh, the, the NYCLU has for decades been on the front lines of protecting the right to protest in New York City. We have litigated major First Amendment cases on behalf of protesters. Uh, we regularly assist protesters in obtaining protest permits. We dispatch teams of protest monitors to observe and report back on protests that happen around the city. Uh, and we, of course, sponsor and organize a, a number of uh, demonstrations uh, and protests of our own. So um, this is something that goes to the core of our organizational mission. And uh, we do thank the council and the committee for its attentiveness in this area. Uh, clearly, there are a lot of overlapping um, issues uh, that are before the committee today. Um, and we do plan on submitting written testimony um, within the next couple of days uh, that will address some issues, uh, some particular issues in a bit more detail. Uh, today, I wanted to uh, speak about something a bit more broadly, uh, which is the outsized role that the NYPD plays um, at all stages of the protest process in New York City and uh, why we think that that role uh, needs to be reconsidered. Um, so as I had mentioned, the NYCLU uh, regularly works with the NYPD uh, to obtain permits and work out logistical issues on behalf of protesters uh, who come to us seeking assistance. Uh, and so drawing on that experience, we have long advocated uh, for a system in which police do not play such a central role um, in all aspects of of protests from the permitting process and onward. Uh, in New York City, the NYPD exerts almost complete control over street protests uh, in, in many ways pursuant to city law. Under city law, protesters are required to obtain permits from the police for demonstrations held on city streets, 
um, and protesters have come to expect significant police presence uh, at their events, even events that are relatively small uh, or draw fewer people. Um, we've seen firsthand uh, how the outsized role of the NYPD in the permitting process uh, can serve as a deterrent uh, for those who are seeking to exercise their First Amendment rights. Uh, there are many activists and organizations, particularly those representing communities that have long been subject uh, for generations to police violence, um, that are understandably wary of a process that is entirely controlled by the NYPD. Uh, it's impossible for us to know just how many would-be protesters have been dissuaded uh, from holding marches or street demonstrations in the first place because they didn't feel like sec they didn't feel secure subjecting themselves to police scrutiny. Uh, the mechanics of the permit process also uh, greatly disadvantage those who are inexperienced working with large bureaucracies and law enforcement bureaucracy in particular. Uh, obtaining a street protest permit often requires, as we know from our work, extensive back and forth discussions with the NYPD about a variety of details, uh, including the purpose of the protest, the location, um, down to itty bitty minutia. Um, and this can be uh, logistically complicated and also quite intimidating for organizers, uh, particularly those who are approaching the process on their own without uh, representation or assistance like that that we sometimes provide. Uh, the practical effect of this is that the street protest permits, uh, is that street protest permits are often inaccessible to less sophisticated and less well-resourced organizations and individuals, while those who have closer connections to the NYPD uh, or just more experience with the process end up getting a greater platform. Uh, this is an inequity uh, that undermines the egalitarian free speech principles mm -hmm. that are embodied in the First Amendment. Um, and it's something that I think the council should be taking seriously while it's examining uh, this broader set of issues. Um, the commonplace presence of police officers at protests, uh, again, often in numbers that appear disproportionate to the size and the nature of the event, uh, can also have an impact on how protesters exercise their right to free speech. Just in the way that um, having to engage with the NYPD to obtain a permit can be a deterrent at the outset, um, encountering a team of armed police officers at an otherwise peaceful demonstration creates an unnecessary sense of anxiety among participants uh, that can dampen uh, the right to uh, free speech and the right to protest. What's more, uh, we believe that the formal involvement of police officers at demonstrations uh, is often, um, in several respects, simply unnecessary. Uh, most protests and demonstrations are peaceful affairs where the primary challenges are logistical, not public safety based. I'm not suggesting that there's no role for police to play in that process, um, but for the, for the NYPD to have such an outsized role and to have exert such control over the entire process um, is often unnecessary. Uh, in our experience, oh, um, I'm out of time, may, may I finish? Sure. Uh, so in our experience, police are not always best equipped to handle these logistical challenges. We've seen this play out um, in a number of uh, contexts, the common use of overuse of metal barricades at protests, uh, the sudden of closing of streets without proper communication to protest organizers, uh, such as happened at last year's, last month's Women's March. Uh, this doesn't have to be how things are done. New York City can and should uh, choose to make its protest scheme more fair and more open. Um, by vesting that, uh, by investing the control that the NYPD now has over the process um, in the authority of a civilian administrative agency. There are many possible alternatives to the system we have now. Um, this is something the council should revisit and we would look forward to working with the council on coming up with an alternative model. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, hi, um, I'm Tawaka Kwasu. I contacted your office yesterday to try to make arrangements such that I could present. Hi. Um, I called your office uh, a couple days ago to make arrangements to present video during today's hearing. Um, unfortunately, I guess uh, the IT staff wasn't um, briefed about that. So although I have videos to present, um, it doesn't... They were. We hooked up the TVs for you. That's why they're on. Sorry? The TVs are on for you, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, why, that's why they're here. You're the only person who had video. I'm looking at the <laughs> laptop read from this uh, external hard drive, but it's not reading from it. So the TV is con connected to this particular laptop, not this one. So and I don't have that port. To... I tried. It doesn't, it doesn't pick up the drive. Okay. I connected would you, it. Would you, like to plug, would you like to connect this yeah. to yours? No, I mean, basically, this is an external hard drive. I plugged it in there. It's not reading the drive. 
That's we why do, I we do SV. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else we would do. Okay, so you could proceed. So, or could and, I? And, you, and you're welcome to submit the video for the record, too, so we could, I would um, love to see it. Hmm. Or you so can describe what the video was going to go so into. So basically, yeah. there okay. are a series of videos. I um, well, let me preface it by saying I was in a deposition yesterday, a four-hour uh, deposition where I made sworn statements against the mayor's NYPD security detail that have been continually uh, violating my civil rights at public meetings since April 27th of last year. Um, earlier, Howard Redman, the mayor's head of security, was in this room. He's currently a defendant in a civil rights lawsuit dating back to an incident from September of 2012. I've made that uh, situation, I, I make your colleagues aware of that situation since last year. There's been no recourse taken. So the question is, if you were mayor, would you let some guy who's defending a federal civil rights lawsuit be your top bodyguard? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And that's well before this, uh, you know, this protest happened just last month. So the question is, if people come into your room to present testimony that they can then fully substantiate through video recordings, through third party witnesses for corroboration, and nothing gets done, don't you kind of expect that the civil rights are, continue, are going to continue to violate civil rights so that your colleagues have a officer's hands um, on their throats at a, a, at a protest where they're exercising their First Amendment rights? Um, I mean, it's just like a rapist, right? They always say, if you have a rapist, they don't get caught, dealt with. They just continue to do it until they're properly dealt with. So um, let me step back a second. The last time I was in this room was on December 14th, giving testimony to Corey Johnson, who's now the speaker. Vanessa Gibson was sitting to, like, right over there. Um, two weeks, within two weeks thereafter, I was illegally stopped, seized, falsely arrested in the Bronx. I was assaulted by the NYPD. I currently have to defend a, fault, a uh, criminal lawsuit against me for exercising my legal self-defense rights against the police officer who assaulted me. So at the time, those two officers that accosted me, they were wearing body cameras. There's been some discussion in the news about how the police union filed a lawsuit to try to uh, block the release of uh, body camera footage. But that happened to me, and this has been happening to me since April 27th. So I guess the question is, if I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, which I am, I took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution against assholes like deputy, so, sorry for the language. Just watch your language, thank you. Um, even though a federal court says I have the, the legal right to use crude and offensive language in a context of complaining about government activity. Trust me, I know the federal court decisions. You have a right, go ahead. Um, so the point is, like I said, I've come into these rooms before, I've testified under, under oath, I've made truthful statements contrary to the police officers that were just sitting in these chairs. So I guess, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're way better than, what's her name, uh, Vanessa Gibson, who also has a federal civil rights lawsuit against her. Basically, she was driving a car, talking on her cell phone. She was issued a I don't want to, uh, and if but we I mean, cannot get is, into, yes, you if you can just speak on your issue, yeah. I would appreciate so that. So thank you. Basically, I've been trying to go to the mayor's public meetings to engage in protective whistleblowing activities against the mayor and his administration. Um, in response to that, I've been illegally kept out of those meetings, so you have First Amendment retaliation at the mayor's public town hall meetings, public resource fair meetings, totaling more than, I'd say, 20 meetings since April 27th. So the question is, if you're a voter and you're trying to make a determination as to whether the candidate that you have the option of voting for best reflects your values, if you have a whistleblower who's being illegally excluded from those uh, public meetings that are being used as campaign events, don't you consider that to be voter fraud, voter suppression? I can't talk about campaign in this uh, in this room. Okay. <laughs> so I guess but I mean, I guess conflict of interest. To wrap rules. it up, I mean, what does it take to have people on your team um, to step up to the to step up to the plate and actually go to bat for someone who's sitting in front of you, testifying under oath, saying First Amendment violations are occurring, federal criminal statutes are being violated by the mayor's NYPD security detail as well as uh, Penny Ringel of the Mayor's Community Affairs Team, Shauna Stribula of the Mayor's Community Affairs Team at these public meetings. I have video from May 23rd in the Bronx Supreme Court where it shows that court officers were working hand in hand with mayors, members of the Mayor's NYPD security detail to keep me and somebody else out of a public meeting. So the question is, if the NYPD has absolutely no jurisdiction inside of a courthouse, just like ICE, then why in the hell 
um, are they able to persuade court officers to violate my civil rights in a courthouse at a public meeting? Well, I, have you filed a complaint with the uh, Civilian Complaint Review Board? Totally useless. They, have you filed a complaint with the CTRB? I have, and they're useless. Okay. I got shoved three times in the chest on an empty public sidewalk on April 27th after Mr. Redman kept me out of that public meeting. So if it happened, and CCRB has not gotten back they, to you. They exonerated the officer who shoved me three times in the chest on an empty public sidewalk. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, if you want to get the information uh, on your complaint to CCRB, we can try to follow up to see where they're at, and we can take it from there. Fair enough. Uh, Councilman Machaca has questions. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you for coming out uh, as well. I also want to uh, say to, I'm sorry, Zachary. Uh, yes, we look forward to hearing a little bit more on it. And I, I do understand there's, you know, certainly a balance that needs to be there, but I'm interested in hearing a little bit more on uh, how we can improve the process. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both for your testimony. Um, Zachary, uh, the, the work that you're doing and the work that you presented, I'm also looking forward to seeing your, your full written testimony. Um, if you remember the questions that I was kind of posing to the NYPD about definition of public safety, I think kind of fall within this concept of, um, or your concept anyway, to remove the processes to make it more egalitarian, more accessible to more people uh, when they want to protest and practice their, their, their rights. Um, you only spoke to protest, and I wonder if there's any connection to protest and civil disobedience and how you kind of handle both of those pieces. Um, civil disobedience is, is an act of protest, but it's a, it's a different level, uh, or is it a different level to you um, in the way that you're thinking about it? So kind of wanted to see if you had any, any thoughts about, about that. I think a lot of that came up today in some incidents that happened in January where, where protests, at, at that, in that day there was a varying degree of um, of response from the NYPD, and, and one was classified as peaceful in the morning, uh, a monthly Jericho walk versus what happened in Broadway. So help us understand how you're thinking about civil disobedience in terms of protest, and are they the same? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, uh, Councilman. It, it's not something that I necessarily came here uh, prepared okay. for. Okay. Can you, can you take that back and, and and have, uh, or connect me with someone over at the ACLU. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that is certainly something um, that uh, we, can, we can take a closer look at um, if it's something that uh, the council okay. is interested in So let me just give you a couple things that would be good to, to kind of sure, open yeah. up in, in discussion. Um, and this is going to be helpful in thinking about uh, the local law that we, were, that we passed last session, mm -hmm. 228, and other things related to city services and where we, we where we bring but if you can if you if we can kind of later talk with with your team about protests and civil disobedience um, thinking about processes uh, and I think you're going to talk a little bit more about that where where does it belong and really come up with concrete recommendations for us to take on as a city council and, and think about um, I'm also thinking about definitions around public safety where where can we land on on what that means. Mm -hmm. That seems super discretionary and, and dangerous in some ways because that can be used um, to justify certain actions. And, and, I, and I, I don't want to remove discretion, but I do want to add definition. And so if that can be helpful for us um, in discussion in the future, it'd be great for you and, and the ACLU uh, to work with us on. Certainly, yeah. No, I, I think those are those are all issues that we are keyed in on um, and do have an interest in exploring. Um, and so uh, we would look forward to working with the council. On. Uh, no more questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, and I want to thank everyone uh, for coming out today. Uh, I want to thank the, the committee staff, uh, Beth Galab, phenomenal job, our legislative counsel, Casey Addison, our legislative policy analyst, Steve, oh, I'm going to mess up your name, Rister. Rister. See, I only call him Steve. Uh, our senior financial analyst and uh, to my legislative director, uh, Jordan Gibbons. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. We look forward to uh, continuing to uh, examine ways to make sure that uh, public safety uh, is at the, the front line 
of, of democracy and, and that we're doing uh, all the right things to ensure that we protect the public while also allowing them to express themselves uh, in a just way. So thank you all for coming out. This hearing is now closed.